Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Um, it's uh, 9 a.m. in Pittsburgh. Um, there's people from all over the world already logged in. Uh, so we're really happy to have everyone here um, and uh, share with you today uh, a beautiful day in the operating room um, on behalf of all of us. Uh, Dr. Gardner, Dr. Snyderman, uh, Dr. Wong, uh, Dr. Stefko, and myself, uh, George Zinanos, we um, will welcome you to today's session. There's, of course, all one of us that's um, the best looking and they're always the best dressed, even in the operating room uh, here, and um, um, we'll get this started. So the first uh, case, um, it will, will be a somewhat of a controversial case. Um, it's a 44-year-old um, woman with longstanding amenorrhea and a known prolactinoma. Um, her prolactin levels had increased from uh, 100 nanograms per ml to 312 with uh, clear tumor growth. Um, and she had consulted with two different endocrinologists to consider medical treatment. That was the first therapy uh, or treatment that was recommended to her. Um, however, she adamantly refused uh, to follow any of those treatments. Uh, she just did not want to be uh, on any kind of uh, medical treatment for, uh, for life or even for an extended period of time. This is the... Um, the follow-up MRI uh, at the time where both her prolactin levels had progressed. You see um, the uh, tumor, the uh, hypo-enhancing uh, mass um, on the right side of the gland uh, and invading into the cavernous sinus. Um, here it looks like there is a, a likely actual involvement of the cavernous sinus. And this is the 2T2 T2 image. Um, on the T2 image, um, again, it, it looks like the uh, the tumor um, is at least invading the, the wall of the cavernous sinus. Obviously, this many times um, is an intraoperative um, uh, assessment, uh, whether there is true invasion and penetration of the wall of the cavernous sinus, and not uh, and this is not just merely pushed. Um, but um, um, of course, uh, this is a, an unconventional. Um, case and there were extensive discussions that we had with the patient. Um, I believe she was quoted um, a 50 to 60 percent chance um, that she could be um, medication free uh, after an attentive procedure. And, and she wanted to proceed with uh, this. That's fine. Someone has their That's microphone. Great. Uh, in the operating room, if you have your microphone on, please um, please turn it off. For the time being. Um, this uh, tumor again was uh, abutting the. the yeah, this right crazy scissors, please. Yes, <sighs> I think we got it done, though. Despite oh, all the pain the ass. Can we can we mute the? Um, the microphone operating room for the time being. Um, <clears throat> we apologize about that. <laughs> so uh, again, the the tumor was um, about abutting uh, and likely invading the wall of the cavernous sinus. This obviously uh, decreases the chances that uh, there's going to be an endocrinologic remission uh, with surgery alone. Um, and that was definitely discussed with the patient. Um, we have it as a standard practice whenever there is a potential uh, of um, uh, entering uh, and exploring the cavernous sinus to do neurophysiologic monitoring uh, of the cavernous sinus. Uh, and depending on the uh, potential compartments of the cavernous sinus that are actually um, involved, uh, these are the cranial nerves that we usually monitor. Uh, the most common cranial nerve that we do is cranial nerve 6. Uh, we show uh, the actual video of our neurophysiologist uh, placing the leads for that. Um, and um, um, 
again, depending on if there's a superior compartment involvement, we do uh, use to um, uh, motor crown nerves uh, three and four in addition to six. Um, but if there's any cavernous sinus invasion, usually um, we do crown nerve six, uh, especially even if it's uh, if there's involvement of the posterior compartment uh, uh, or, the, or the inferior compartment. And lastly, um, we have to think about reconstruction um, for a tumor that um, is uh, relatively small. Um, uh, there's a question whether to raise a nasal septal flap, uh, and we'll discuss a little bit more um, while in the operating room, um, the, what the surgical plan will be. Um, for Certainly for very large tumors um, that we know we're going to get a cerebral spinal fluid leak, um, or especially tumors that are extending low, um, raising a nasal septal flap um, is, um, is something that we do usually. Uh, alternatively, uh, preserving the pedicles, um, the so-called rescue flaps, and subsequently doing it later uh, is another viable uh, option um, to do it uh, if needed. In terms of the positioning of the instruments in the operating room, uh, we do use a four-handed technique, um, and uh, usually the um, Endoscope comes in from the patient's right nostril and occupies the upper part of the nostril. And um, the neurosurgeon instruments uh, come from either nostrils, left-handed and right-handed, um, and occupy the lower part of each nostril. Uh, these are a typical setup in the operating room with uh, two surgeons side by side, the EMT surgeon usually on the left side and the uh, neurosurgeon on the right side. Um, we have our uh, two screens that are across each other. Uh, the patient's head is slightly turned uh, to the right side in slight extension. There are slight variations depending on how low and how um, high uh, the tumor goes or the lesion goes that we are attacking um, with how much extension we give the patient. We have our neurophysiologist and our image guides uh, on the side and of course anesthesia on the left side of the patient with a scrub nurse um, on the right side of both of us. This is a typical setup. Uh, again, with the two screens opposing each surgeon and the uh, image guidance uh, system on the left side. In the far back, uh, we have our neurophysiologists. Um, we do use the um, uh, OR tables that have the capacity to go quite low. Um, this uh, is a key to um, uh, preserve the ergonomics of uh, surgery and uh, make even longer surgeries um, uh, possible um, without um, strain. Um, these also allow uh, the patient to go quite low uh, in order to achieve uh, some, uh, trend, some reverse trend um, uh, position, usually 15 degrees, um, which uh, decreases venous um, pressure and decreases um, uh, bleeding um, while uh, keeping the overall height of the, of the bed uh, low enough uh, for us to work comfortably. Again, keeping the bed low, uh, keeping our uh, elbows around 90 degrees. Uh, it's key uh, for uh, being able to perform long uh, and arduous surgeries um, uh, easier uh, and without strain being uh, part of, of the surgery. Um, this is the video from this morning, actually. Um, our neurophysiologist here evaluating the later on. Can't hear the
I'm hearing that uh, the actually the audio feed is not uh, transferring, so I'm just going to restart the video um, and uh, just um, uh, narrate it myself. Um, so again, in the beginning, we um, want to make sure that we inspect the eyes. Um, we're going to place leads for uh, current nerves uh, three, uh, four, uh, and six. The first lead that we're going to put in here uh, is the lead for the, the medial rectus, which is corresponds to current nerve three. Um, this goes just medial, um, just, uh, just at the medial canthus. Uh, it is important to displace um, the the globe itself before actually placing the leads. Um, we place two leads um, for each current nerve. And once this is placed um, exactly where it needs to be, uh, we use some tape uh, to make sure it's secured uh, adequately. Uh, subsequently, we're going to put the, um, uh, the lead for uh, the superior oblique. Um, we palpate the supratrochlear notch uh, to which corresponds roughly to the um, pulley of the trochlea. Um, and again, uh, using two um, leads, uh, we displace the globe down uh, and place it roughly just uh, medial to the uh, 12 o'clock position. Once these are adequately placed, um, again, placing um, some tape uh, can keep it in place. And lastly, uh, we're going to put the lead for uh, the lateral rectus uh, for cranial nerve six. Displacing the globe uh, medially now uh, and uh, putting one above and one below uh, la the lateral canvas. Retroviral hematoma is a potential complication. Uh, from this procedure, it is exceedingly rare uh, in experienced hands, um, but it is a potential complication. Um, interestingly, um, the, there was a, a spur uh, and some thinning um, of the and deviation of the septum um, on the, the patient's um, uh, left side. Um, which uh, will be um, a consideration for uh, raising a nasal septal flap. Um, and we'll uh, discuss a little bit with Dr. Wong uh, and draw probably what his thoughts are um, about, uh, about reconstruction. So it's uh, right about time. We'll transfer uh, back uh, to the operating room to see how our, our surgeons, Dr. Uh, Eric Wong uh, and Dr. Gardner, uh, are doing there. <clears throat> All right. Um, Dr. Wong, can you hear us in the operating room? We'll give them a minute to uh, turn the microphone on. You see Dr. Wong is uh, raising a nasoceptal flap. Um, he's completing his superior cut. Are we able to get a feed from the from the operating room? Uh, an audio feed?
any case, so um, Dr. Wan, as we said, was is, is raising uh, and is up to flap. Um, obviously, there are some challenges. So there are some anatomical challenges for it. Um, this will be a case where uh, there will be likely uh, an exposure of the right paracelacroid artery. Uh, and uh, therefore, many times, even though um, there may be not a high flow leak, uh, exposure of the uh, complete um, paracelacroid artery, um, where in this case we may consider uh, resecting the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, such an extent of exposure, just even, even in its own, sometimes warrants raising an aseptal flap. Um, I see Dr. Gardner is also on the line. Uh, Dr. Gardner, what um, what were your thought processes here? Down Harrison, using um, uh, a flap versus not? Down, please. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, you know, we had, we finally got. I think we finally have Dr. Wong uh, unmuted. We had to double double mute him. Um, the idea here is both the carotid exposure and also because this is a functional tumor. The desire for either extracapsular or peeling the capsule of the tumor is higher risk for a CSF leak. Uh, so for those combined reasons, we decided to do a nasal septal flap. You could absolutely try to do a free mucosal uh, graft as well. She'd had some prior nasal surgery and that uh, impacted it a little bit. But uh, the main uh, consideration was carotid coverage and the risk of CSF leak. But I, I really think that there's an argument that could be made as well for uh, just doing uh, a free graft in this situation. Dr. Wong, uh, can you uh, take us a little bit through your thought process about raising this flap, uh, deciding the right sided versus left sided, given her, um, given her special anatomic, um, uh, the, 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 her, the challenges and her prior sure. surgery. Go ahead. Well, I mean, primarily she has a right sided tumor. So normally that means we, we try our very best to do a to try, a flap on the contralateral side to keep the pedicle, which is in the way in many cases, right? Because it's more superficial than the area we're working um, on the contralateral side away from the area that we need exposure. And her, the challenge was she had a very large spur. It's now all been resected. I don't know if Dr. Zinonis was able to show you an image or Dr. Gardner. We but unfortunately, she had a spur impinging upon the inferior turbinate all the way over here. So uh, my strategy for this was um, after I made my cuts, uh, which were a little bit difficult to accomplish, I have a tendency to make my sphenoidotomy first. So I was able to lateralize the turb enough. Here's the remnant of the superior turb. Here's the posterior ethmoid cavity that I had open. I like to make this cut across. So it gives me my posterior cut here, which I was able to accomplish um, relatively well, despite somewhat um, narrow cavity because of the septum. And then um, as I mo after I uh, did that, then I made my inferior cut. And this was always a little bit of a stretch because of the challenge of the big spur like that was essentially right in the middle of the view. But I was able to get most of it done. I have a little bit. Normally, I like to finish this cut just a little bit more than I have. But I think it should be adequate for a pituitary defect. But as you mobilize this, you want to try to lateralize it a little bit more. So can I have a 45 degree curtsy scissor? So you can see the artery on the back edge actually right there on this particular one. She has fairly thin sinus or septal mucosa, primarily because of, I think, her deviation for a long time. But in any case, um, so here you can actually start to see her artery right there, okay? So we'll avoid that. I mean, my inferior cut along the arch of the coina here and then along the floor underneath this bony spur. So that was my one advantage is that this part of the maxillary crest was fairly straight and then the spur kind of turned out here and then finished the cut there. And then I, the superior cut wasn't too bad because I was able to already know that I could move, mobilize the turb enough to see the superior cut. We try to keep this under the olfactory cleft so that all this olfactory mucosa is preserved. And then you can see how the septum really turns out here. And I had resected a large part of it to get there. And then here's my superior cut. You know, we want to take it very fairly high to get a wide, robust flap. So you want to leave a little bit on the top, but and then you connect it to a hemitransfixion incision anteriorly. And then my strategy was to work underneath the um, bottle, to work underneath the big spur first. So essentially, um, I raised the flap underneath it here first, and then I came anteriorly, raised it as much as and high as possible to give as much freedom of mobility of the soft tissue. 
and then finally came around the edge of the spur. I actually think, we'll see when we put it up, but I don't think I actually got a tear in it somewhat miraculously, and sometimes that means you're better lucky than good. So, um, but that was the whole strategy for this particular flap, and now you can see we can bring the, um, down Kerrison, you can bring the sphenoidotomy down all the way to the floor of the sphenoid sinus, and then I'm going to turn my attention to the reverse flap. Um, I'll, I'll turn it back to George to talk about other reconstructive considerations for this while I just finish up this little bit of exposure here. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, th things that we uh, also think about uh, when considering raising a flap or not, um, obviously trying to preserve the pedicles. Uh, if a tumor is extending quite low, um, even if uh, in, the, in the instance of a pituitary adenoma, but that has uh, extension, let's say, down in the climate where the particular anatomy is such that um, we know we're going to have a significant extension inferiorly. Um, it does get increasingly um, uh, more difficult to uh, to, preser to preserve uh, the pedicle uh, the lower we go down. Uh, the majority of times when we have um, uh, ENT surgeons like Dr. Wong and Dr. Uh, Snyderman that they have uh, also, too, please. however, that does become more uh, challenging. Um, obviously, uh, there, as Dr. Gardner was uh, mentioning, uh, we don't necessarily have to use um, a nasocephal flap in, in this instance. Um, and usually, if the right uh, turbinate, uh, right middle turbinate is uh, resected, we can use that. Or alternatively, if we're preserving both turbinates, um, that is um, many times a preference. Um, is to use a, a, a nasal floor uh, graft, which is uh, yep. quite robust as well. <clears throat> the um, reverse yeah, flap that Dr. Wong is doing now uh, is actually uh, something that um, has uh, hopefully decreased um, the instance of uh, nasal collapse. Um, and uh, it does provide some vascularization yeah, to the denuded uh, septum. Uh, this is the first time actually today we're going to see um, whether this uh, has some vascularity uh, on the reverse flap, uh, something we will evaluate a little bit later uh, with uh, ICG um, uh, angiography. Just while we are uh, showing this reverse flap, we want to also remind and invite uh, everyone to feel free to put any questions into the question and answer uh, chat function on Teams Live. Uh, and we can obviously relay those and answer any questions along the way. We want this to be as interactive as possible. So anything you see that you have questions about or, or even comments about, um, please feel free to, to chime in. Uh, through that question and, ask and answer function. Dr. Wong, you want to comment on, you know, that this is our so-called reverse flap, which is designed to cover the uh, yes, please. denuded septum. And you make the same sort of cuts as you would make for a nasal septal flap? Can you hear me, Paul? Yes, yeah. we can hear you well. Yeah. yeah, so it's essentially the same in the, we just don't go as anteriorly. So you can see we're here. My my usual guide is I want to get in front of the middle turbinate. Sometimes you do need to extend your decision just a little bit more, but this is a very similar cut to what you do for the a, a standardized nasal septal flap. Similarly, up top here, we're going to do a similar cut, staying way below the olfactory cleft. Oh, sorry. So here you can see this is the olfactory mucosa above. Can I have a pituitary, please? Let me get rid of this little bone chip so we can see just a little bit better. Get rid of some of the smoke from that. The smoke evacuation isn't quite as good once the flap is filling up the nasopharynx. But here we're going to preserve all of the olfactory mucosa above. So I'm using the superior turbinate as my guideline here. I partially trimmed the inferior one half to get access. I'm going to stay below this olfactory cleft, but paralleling the skull base until in front of the middle turbinate again. So right about in here or so. Okay. And then, because we believe that we have a good flap on the other side, so we always do this second. Um, now we're going to sacrifice the vascular pedicle. Can I have a suction cautery, please? You can do this a lot of different ways, but in this particular case, we're just going to use a suction bovie. 
that come across the anterior sphenoid face. We're going to get through both of the posterior septal branches of the sphenopalatine artery. So here's our sphenoidotomy above. So we're going to just ablate the vascular pedicle here with cauterization. And connect it to our cut below. You can see our cut below here is almost there. So we'll just kind of finish out this cut. You know, interesting um, side. And then we'll begin to elevate this over. I have a suction. Interesting Go side ahead. discussion that you know has come up quite a bit is uh, is doing endonasal surgery. Uh, you know, during this COVID pandemic, which of course involves the nasal tissues when it's present, and and we have not uh, really changed our practice. Of course, we stopped elective surgery like everyone, but um, once patients you know need surgery, we don't change our approach. In other words, if we think an endonasal approach is best, we use an endonasal approach. Um, you know, I think preoperative testing of some sort helps us feel a little safer, but in the end, uh, we're all wearing uh, N95 masks, and I think that's pretty yeah, bipolar, standard, and, and we feel pretty safe doing it. Um, you know, Dr. Wong, uh, for better or worse, also has a fair amount of experience uh, even operating in the COVID positive population. Um, and so I think that. Uh, Definitely think for that the worst, Dr. Gardner. On <laughs> we, we feel as though, though this is ex extremely safe. We um, don't have any incidents in our facility of, of any transmission of personnel from that kind of a setting. Um, and I think I haven't really seen much report of that, but I think that's a very you know, interesting topic, and, and I believe very strongly that we shouldn't change our approach because of our our fear of of you know from asymptomatic patients, for example. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. So to add, uh, we were discussing earlier that this uh, uh, obviously uh, the surgery on a prolactinoma is somewhat controversial, um, and uh, we discussed about uh, the this, uh, the the back and forth that was had uh, with the patient. Um, I was wondering if you could um, uh, comment a little bit on that and your thought process. Um, yeah, great, great point. This is this is a tough a tough one, and it's uh, you know it is it is controversial. Um, this is a patient who has been counseled over many years. I've followed her now for about seven years, and simply has not wanted uh, to have a regular medication, and also has not wanted has had some fear of you know some of the minor side effects. I have, she has seen no fewer than, I think, three endocrinologists. And even most recently, uh, I sent her for further counseling with, you know, with an advice that uh, medication would manage her problem. Um, but she very is very clear about uh, not minding uh, the only side effect she has from the tumor itself, which is, uh, which is her loss of her uh, menstruation, uh, loss of her period. Um, but the I fact that the tumor has grown pretty, uh, significantly over the last four or five years leads to some sort of treatment necessary. Um, I only quoted her about a 60 to 70 percent chance of, of being medication free or being tumor free, uh, which is based on our um, own I right there, publication. Um, but I and I do think this Auto case provides some challenges. We have to do a cavernous wall resection. Uh, you know, we looked at this in, uh, uh, in a paper with Dr. Fernandez and found that uh, about 80% uh, of functional tumors, when when we thought the cavernous wall had contact with the tumor, about 80% of those had histological evidence of invasion. So I think this does require a medial cavernous Double action scissor, uh, section. But and I think that Double if action the scissor. patient really prefers this and has been properly counseled, that it is a, an appropriate indication um, for uh, for resection of prolactinoma. I think certainly in the U.S. that that is. Um, Typically, this would be treated with medication, but I, I also don't have a problem um, if I think I have a chance at getting rid of the tumor if a patient is educated with uh, with removing it. But um, the you know the nasal septal flap, as we talked about, because that carotid is going to be exposed as part of this, we feel much better covering that with vascularized tissue. Although I I think certainly that could be done with a free graft as well. So my two flaps are kind of getting in the way of each other. Let me put my nasal septal flap back in that nasal pharynx. I leave this little arch of the coina there just as a retractor in a sense. Okay. And then we're going to pull the reverse flap anteriorly here, see if we get enough coverage. I'm a little bit worried that my superior incision is not quite adequate enough, but we'll see in a second. 
So, so Eric, Eric there's, a, there's a question here about uh, about about the, the pedicle being sacrificed um, uh, on the side where you took the reverse flap. I think we did, you know, we skipped over the initial nasal septal flap, and so there is a nasal septal flap on the left side. But Eric, why not? Why not just preserve the pedicle on that right side as well? Why do this rescue? Um, flap? What are the pros and cons of doing that versus saving that other that other that other pedicle? Absolutely. Caudal, please. Um, you know, I think the pros of saving the pedicle is it maximizes your reconstructive options. Um, mm -hmm. It does limit a little bit of our cavernous sinus visualization and approach because we got to go pretty lateral there. Yeah. Um, the, the reason we sort of moved to reverse flaps, and I, I'll tell you that I started very hesitantly, and I started with when we did clival cases, posterior fossa cases, where we had to sacrifice this pedicle to get adequate access. Oral flank stitch. Um, and um, what we found was that the, these patients do very well. They, they heal very well from a sinal nasal standpoint, likely because we're covering their cartilage. You can see here that this vascular pedicle covers the entirety of the exposed cartilage inferiorly, and actually most of it superiorly as well. There's a little bit up there, but very little actually that's still exposed, uh, even though I think we raised a fairly robust flap. Um, and so that's how we started. In cases we knew we needed to sacrifice it. And so, um, can I have another stitch out for this too? And, and then we found that the outcomes are really good. And so we kept moving it forward, and more forward and more forward. But I will tell you, I was a little hesitant at first. Dr. Gardner will tell you I was very hesitant at first. And then um, ended up finding it to be actually superior from a sinonasal healing standpoint. So what I'm doing is I'm putting a transeptal suture. Could you hold this for me? Sean, so they can see a little bit. Um, so I, I threw it through the flap side, through the septum on the contralateral side, and then this is just a simple um, horizontal mattress suture, essentially. And um, so the outcomes are better uh, from a sinonasal standpoint. And so when you, when you have to sacrifice the pedicle anyway for access, I think this is a huge advantage. And this is a little bit more of a plus or minus, you know, because you might be able to raise another flap later but I haven't found that to be overly necessary. And I feel like if we get a good flap first, sacrifice of the pedicle becomes uh, less important. So we're gonna just throw one more of those sutures to hold it in while we talk. But the downside of course, is that you, you lose one vascular reconstruction option later, which is the, um, the contralateral uh, right-sided flap for this particular case. Does that answer the question? I think that was quite comprehensive. Uh, Eric, yeah. uh, there is another um, there's another interesting uh, question from the audience about um, whether it's worth uh, resecting the the medial wall of the cavernous sinus uh, with lateral adenomas that potentially just abutting um, the lateral wall. Uh, okay. Even if we thought that there was a, an adequate um, extracapsular or, or pseudocapsular dissection, um, and uh, obviously there is evidence yeah. of um, microscopic involvement uh, of the uh, uh, media wall, the cavernous sinus. Dr. Gardner, what's your thought process on this? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, uh, this is a, an evolving field. I think even, you know, two decades ago, this concept of extra capsular dissection really was only published by Oldfield uh, over a decade ago. Um, and the concept of, of the pseudo capsule around uh, functional microadenomas is an important one. Um, the, but the pseudocapsule, uh, if it comes in contact or has to be peeled off the medial cavernous wall, then we have found that the cavernous wall may be involved in those situations. One of the advantages of the endoscope and having a very clear view is hopefully we'll have a very clear idea of whether or not that medial wall is involved. Uh, and I think that's one of the oh, points that, that, we, that we pick up with this is is as we do that extra capsular dissection, or in some cases, obviously you're not able to if that breaks down, um, or uh, that you'll have a good idea if there's true separation from the medial wall. And you're absolutely correct, if there's real separation, uh, I think we don't resect it, um, but this is a judgment made at the time of surgery. I would be surprised if this doesn't Harrison, have invasion just because of the uh, amount of tumor going into that superior uh, uh, medial cavernous compartment. Again, I would refer everyone to the uh, anatomy uh, article 
that uh, Dr. and Dr. Fernandez Miranda's uh, cavernous sinus um, uh, compartments, but I believe this is going into the superior compartment, and I do believe that we will see uh, invasion uh, of that wall. Um, to uh, address another question, another comment, and I think one of the one of the things that we're hoping to really um, highlight here is some of the new technologies that I think have allowed us to do things like cavernous resection. Uh, one of the main ones is, is fluorescence. We have one of the, the new fluorescent systems here, uh, which is the, the storage Rubina system, which uh, has a really interesting overlay um, of the fluorescence. Initial systems didn't overlay, but this is side-by-side -side cameras and side-by-side -side light source Double inside the same camera and the same scope. And you'll see how that allows us to overlay it. And this is just a module we can actually add on to our existing system. So we didn't have to purchase a new system to have this. This is just a, a module that gets added on to our existing so scopes. Um, the, uh, so it's, you know, we'll uh, all learn together about nice. how this system works. Uh, we've used a lot of fluorescence. It's very useful for flaps and we'll use it uh, throughout this. I, I'd say from a, visualization standpoint that's one of the that's one of the new um, uh, updates um, and that's sort of the system that you're seeing here it's even though it has you know two light sources and two cameras and two LEDs uh, you see uh, that that dual design really doesn't we don't lose any quality in fact if anything I think we've picked up some quality with it so um, it's it, uh, it's something I'm pretty excited about. That's one of the goals of this uh, live Here's broadcast to, is to demonstrate that. Um, George, what other uh, newer technologies um, do you think have uh, have come along in the last, you know, say two or three or even five years that have made a real difference in in uh, our surgery? Um, the, the last two or three years, you said. Yeah, or you know, recently since you know since you've started doing this surgery, what things do you think have made the biggest difference? Since I've done it, where well, that goes a little bit further back. Um, sure. Ob obviously, obviously, um, um, having uh, having a Down high here. definition, and now hopefully uh, moving to the uh, the four K systems. Sure. Um, will uh, will even further allow um, uh, just clearer definition of the tissues, uh, and kind of better understanding um, the, um, uh, the bipolar cautery. Um, I think the, the evolution of them um, and even uh, uh, micro instruments um, that uh, allow us to dissect um, and okay, even having single shaft appliers. Um, to, for, to perform vascular surgery, um, micro graspers and micro dissectors. Uh, all these things have made surgery obviously uh, quite more uh, safe. Uh, the 3D systems are uh, still evolving, I believe, um, but there are some uh, very good systems that are, are coming out uh, in the market right now and that those may further uh, further, what uh, what we can do and what we can understand during during surgery, um, and potentially, you know, sh shortly down the road, there might be um, augmented reality systems that may be incorporated uh, in surgery as well. Dr. Gardner, um, you know, that's an interesting interesting point. You know, the three D technologies had had a lot of um, energy put into them, and the interesting thing is, I think that is that that 3D technology, which is dual cameras, is part of what I think led to the dual camera and dual source uh, technology that's now used for, for fluorescence like this, which has, I think, made a bigger difference in, in the surgery we do. Dr. Gardner, can you tell us a little more about contact endoscopy that may be coming down, uh, down the line and potential uses of that? Yeah, that's something we, we don't know. It's sort of we're curious to see there are a lot of different types of, of both microscopy and endoscopy where we're trying to do things like histology in the field. Um, I think that's an area that uh, really needs a lot of work. I think there are uh, other areas of fluorescence that people are studying, you know, different dyes and, uh, and antibody tagged yeah. um, uh, uh, dyes, for example. So there, there's, a, there's a lot coming down the pipe and I think endoscopes allow us to take advantage of that in some ways because of uh, the endoscope being an instrument in the field. We sort of 
lose track of that. But I think that remains okay. remains very much to be seen. But there's some exciting technology coming. Dr. Wong, in terms of the um, ICG and geography uh, and its usefulness to gauge the viability of our reconstructive tissues, uh, can you take us a little bit through how you think about it and what um, how does that potentially can change uh, management even intraoperatively or postoperatively? Sure. So, you know, I think that unfortunately one of the challenges of ICG right now that we're still working through caudal, please, is that it's not particularly um, objective findings. It's a little bit of there's some learner uh, learning aspects to it, like how much fluorescence is present, but it it becomes fairly intuitive fairly quickly. So we first started with our nasal septoplasts because we don't really have a way, um, bipolar please, of interoperatively assessing that. So we started by giving an um, a ICG angiography uh, run at bipolar on. And what we noticed, bipolar on, thank you, that, that there seemed to be a difference at times, off please, between uh, whether the vascular pedicle uh, was fluorescing immediately during the case, down kerosene, or if the entirety of the body was. So when the entirety of the body was fluorescing, we were very happy. We weren't as sure what was going to go on when the when it was just the uh, pedicle. Would that mean some of the body would necrose eventually? What, what, would, what does that mean? So we actually went and started studying this in a systematic way. We evaluated every nasal septal flap in that regard for a little while. And we found that is that actually the majority of the time, as long as you, um, so I'm looking at my carotid here, my parapharyngeal carotid to see how much more exposure I need down here before we get this citation out. Down, Kerrison. Um, that uh, when the pedicle enhanced, actually the vast majority of the time the flap did well. Unfortunately, it's not 100%. Like all things, it's not 100%. And I probably suggest pituitary that there are other reasons that a flap can die besides just its vascular arterial input. But it gave us our first real-time um, assessment of the flap itself. Now, there were a couple instances where the pedicle didn't light up. And maybe that's because it was twisted or placed into like the vascular sinus for the length of the case or some other sorts of um, manipulations that could have hurt the pedicle itself, at least in a temporary stance, and then it came back. So it doesn't mean that necessarily if you don't have um, ICG input into the flap, that the flap is going to die, but it does heighten your um, post-operative care protocol um, straight through cut. And so we tend to get a very early MRI in that setting for sure to ensure that um, we can see if the flap, now that it's been placed in the right position, um, is uh, enhances or not. And that's still the gold standard is gadolinium enhanced MRI. But it provides us an increased ability to, to tailor our care and I think that that has a lot of value and benefit in this particular setting. We're still exploring exactly how to quantitate that and whether we can um, make that the gold standard answer moving forward. But I'm excited about the technology and the opportunities for that. Harrison, too. Am I unmuted there? Looks like Dr. Gardner is going to join me. All right. He's board watching me. Yeah, I mean, it's a good. It's a good point. Uh, it's one of the things that that we've noticed okay. with this Rubina system is a better ability to perhaps quantify. It's never going to be uh, uh, truly quantifiable, but to better quantify the uh, how much fluorescence there actually is. You know, we uh, do it subjectively and we found that <clears throat> that we can tell if there's no uh, no fluorescence. But the degree of fluorescence, I think, matters to some degree as well. And <clears throat> so we're uh, sort of trying to understand that better. Protective devices. Paul, can you uh, put a couple of conduits in the nose to help protect that reverse flap? Oh, can we can we do an ICG run before uh, Dr. Gardner scrubs in? Yeah. Where so we kind of want to see what this reverse flap would look like. We actually haven't done this yet. It's going to give a half dose, okay? So the five cc's, which is twelve and a half milligrams of indocyanin green. Coddle, please. And you're going to give that if you can give that in whatever IV is closest to the heart. And we'll give it as a push with a, a 10 cc flush once Dr. Wong says okay, and we're ready. And let's see, let's um, we're in ICG overlay mode here now, so you see it doesn't change our view, so we can operate while this is happening. You ready okay. for them to enjoy? Do it. Yeah. 
So I could slide past this real fast and look at the carotids if we needed to. You can obviously see the tumor quite well already. Now there is a mode that um, allows us to be sort of monochromatic and we can see very bright fluorescence coming through, um, but you lose the anatomy somewhat then because it, it blacks out the color image. You can see the carotid coming in. The beauty of this is you can really form a mental image of where that carotid is. You can see the venous flow now coming into the inferior uh, sinus, inferior intercavernous sinus, as well as the basilar plexus. Look at the back of your flap. Do you see pedicle of the flap enhancing? Usually you can see the vessel. Sometimes you have to flip it forward. Sometimes we can see it. There you go. There's a vessel right there coming in. So we can see the blood supply coming in. And again, we can magnify this if necessary by, yeah, there we see nice, nice flow into the flap. There really is right now. Let's try to keep it that way, huh, Dr. Runner? Yes, uh, no promises. Yeah. <laughs> you see the middle picture. terminate lights up nice and well. You see the normal mucosa, look how well that lights up. And now we've never done this. Look at the reverse flap before. We're starting to see a little bit here. Should be a random supply, right, from the other side? Well, it comes from the facial. Okay. From the facials across, and that's what we're sort of depending on. From the contralateral facial. From the contralateral yep. side. So it comes from this side, where you can see it's really robust on the skin, and the mucosa is starting to come across there now. The one thing you'll notice with the IC green, and this is this true whether you use a microscope or an endoscope, it is distance dependent. So you have to get close to the surface to understand what its fluorescence is. It it's also definitely <laughs> lining up well. Yeah. Well, it, um, also, one thing to, in addition to the distance is the angle. So if you're too angled um, with the light source, that's another factor that potentially. Right. 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 So, so these are these are coming from above. These are coming from the anterior ethmoid supply, right? Looks nice. So we don't see too much yet, but maybe we'll take another yeah, look, take a look later. later. Sure. Let me deploy those. But actually, you can see how it's coming across. So. You're starting to see a little bit there. Yeah, we, we've had really good success with them. This is the first time we looked with um, an ICG run, but so maybe it just takes a little bit of time too as we have started. Certainly not robust, and you can definitely tell the difference between the native mucosa enhancing very briskly and, and this reverse flap, which has yeah. a very random supply. All right. <clears throat> can I have the nasal protective sleeves, please? Oh, right there. Yeah, one of the one of the things uh, uh, Dr. Gardner asked me a little bit later uh, sure, earlier, sure. what, what sure. were the advancements, and I miss actually mentioning the um, the nasal protective sleeves. Actually, completely changed um, how we do uh, endonasal surgery. At least in my view, they um, uh, when when I first started, obviously getting your hands in and out of the nose um, was one of the challenges in making sure that. That's Especially for the neurosurgeons, as they start doing these procedures and a little bit less um, experience with with uh, both the anatomy, but as well as uh, kind of the muscle memory of get, get going in and out of the nose, you, the nasal mucosa mucosa was definitely taking a um, a hit, uh, and also um, uh, being able to drive and keeping hemostasis, keeping the scope uh, clean um, has has was yeah, also we switch, uh, uh, switch out the scopes. Uh, Those are new. Uh, another uh, advantage is sometimes when we do um, endo uh, endoscopic surgery through unconventional corridors, so just for example, through a transmaxillary corridor, uh, having such a sleeve in place um, can potentially navigation, navigation, open. Um, much more readily, much more readily available as opposed to someone having to keep a retractor. Uh, and, and lastly, but you know, and it's not the, uh, the last thing that this is good for, uh, especially for tumors such as corporal, over here if you want to. And feed. Um, this is a nice way to potentially avoid feeding of the uh, uh, passage. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I think I, w I would warn you about using the nasal sleeves because once you start to use them, you get very used to them and then I don't like to operate without them, Coddle. Uh, it really makes life a lot easier. There was an earlier version of them um, where um, by the end of the case, they would get somewhat uh, sticky because the hydrophilic coating um, would wear off and um, there were some issues with that. They're also less stretchable. Um, 
I believe like a later station um, uh, has overcome both of these issues. going to use these, I think. Here I'll use as well as um, making a weave where it can be stretched. Focus in. Have to find what's bleeding down here. So, Dr. Sir, Barton, uh, uh, the question would be, for example, um, for some cases, why uh, go so low? Why expose the rostrum and go to the floor of the sphenoid? Um, since we're only on well. the pituitary, why, why do surges such a wide sphenoidotomy, which could potentially uh, compromise, let's say, some, uh, some of the pedicles uh, if you were, were not going to uh, elevate a flap? Yeah, I mean, this is, I think, I think part of the bias is we don't view this as, you know, just pituitary surgery. We don't follow some of the uh, tenets of curettes, et cetera. We view this drill as skull-based surgery. And so skull-based surgery is designed to do a wide exposure and uh, to really have good access. So it's not this necessarily less invasive, uh, quite the contrary, but we do think our ability to see and do more is really the, the point. I, I think this case will demonstrate that, I hope, with an ability to deal with the cavernous pituitary. Now, because the nasal septal flap is uh, our reconstruction here, I can I know I can and probably want to strip a lot of the sphenoid mucosa. What, clean? Because the nasal septal flap needs a denuded surface to heal to. So I'm going to try to strip a lot of this. Let me get a scissor, though. I want to strip all of it. Uh, that's sort of coming off nicely there. And I know I'm going to want to cover down here. And we sort of peel this very early because you get some venous bleeding, obviously. And we want to get that. It'll sort of stop on its own really pretty quickly if we peel it early. All right, now just some black tip uh, irrigation. This is just warm water irrigation. One of the most important hemostatic techniques that we use. Uh, warm water, of course, activates the coagulation cascade. You get a scissor uh, left, the store scissor left. Now, this point, point as we mentioned at the beginning, putting um, the patient, especially uh, bigger habitus patients in uh, enough reverse Trendelenburg position, uh, right. where it's uncompromised, um, uh, the, the pressure. Um, but it will decrease the venous uh, pressures that it's, it's very, very ben beneficial. There's a little bit of feel here. I'm sort of removing a little more. Dr. Wong's done a spectacular job of giving me a very wide sphenodotomy. Removing the rostrum like he did is a critical step because that's really free bone. There's no consequence for the nose for doing it. There's no consequence. There's no real risk to vascular structures except for the pedicle of the flap, which he's already addressed. And it gives me such uh, a good place to set, set my instruments because we leave the scope above it. Now I'm just going to reduce some of these septations over the sphenoid and the, or rather over the cella and the tuberculum. I like to always think about making every cell look about the same. And we need a, a wide exposure of the cell. I'm not going to just make a little opening here and shell out the tumor, suction out the tumor. Certainly could do that, um, and you'd have a reasonable result, but I want to try to get as close to a cure as I can. And that's going to also involve skeletonizing that carotid pituitary. You see a little more mucosa I've left here. You get a good sense of our carotid protuberance right there. It doesn't look dehiscent, although it's very thin. Nice, uh, deep. <laughs> lateral o lateral OCR, which is the optic strut right there. There's our optic strut. There's our optic nerve right there. Now, uh, drill. We use navigation for all of these cases. I think it's great to have it as a confirmatory tool. I don't rely on navigation, but let me see the navigation for a moment. I'm just checking here to confirm that my that's my carotid protuberance. It indeed uh, looks like it. I believe we're not able to broadcast this. Is that correct? Okay. So there's our carotid protuberance. Navigation is dead on. 
That shows the tumor right there, very accurate. There's our tuberculum, there's our optic. So I just like to confirm those things, make sure I am, what I am seeing is correct. Um, I have uh, another very good confirmation, which is Dr. Wong. Uh, we, there's a lot of this that's unspoken where we will, you know, review. let me shorten that drill a little bit just so we don't drill on the pedicle. But, you know, we sort of underestimate some of those aspects of uh, two surgeon surgery and that, that, you know, there's a second surgeon here who is ensuring that what I'm saying and what I'm seeing, the way I'm seeing the anatomy is correct. Now, I don't have to expose this carotid, but I do want to expose the whole cell on this side. I'm just going to thin the bone here. Remember, the carotid makes a C shape here. It goes from medial to lateral right here, and then comes more medial again at the carotid protuberance. And if I follow that C shape, I can more safely expose uh, more widely. Now, Dr. Gardner, uh, on the side that we will expose the carotid artery um, and, um, and potentially do a medial wall resection, uh, can you take us a little bit through what your strategy is, your surgical strategy, um, about uh, going, uh, going and doing that? Clean that, please. Yeah, that's a great point. So my, my goal there, let me see a coddle for a moment, is to expose the cella itself first and then the drill. Um, so I thin the bone, remove the cell in a pretty standard fashion. Pituitary, just a little bone spur that is blocking me out a little bit, or part of the septation of the ethmoid. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna expose the cella, thin and remove the bone. Where you'll see I'll use a kerosene, but I don't use a kerosene as a biting instrument. I use it as a grasper and a dissector. It works very nicely in that, in that manner. Uh, and then after I've exposed the cella, then I'll move on to exposing the carotid and exposing the cavernous sinus. Right. I, I, uh, a way I, I always like to um, um, tell the residents, also the, the, our fellows, um, is that if you decide that you're going to expose uh, that media wall or expose the entire carotid, um, you can't, it's, it's much more dangerous to actually inch laterally uh, than just take the jump. Where the, the bone becomes thin again is actually right over the carotid. And if you think about it, it's almost like exposing the sphenoid wing for neurosurgeons. Um, so you have to expose the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe and then, you know, make, yes. make way in between. Uh, so that's, that's going to be a, this partition that, that uh, exists between the cella um, and the carotid artery. Uh, usually, when we have large adenoma, this is thin. Our, our or, or this become the more robust this partition is. So, I'm not quite thin enough here. I'd like this to peel off a little better. It's a little thick right here still. Now you see, Dr. Wong is constantly trying to uh, keep the field wet. The reason he's here again all the time uh, is to try and uh, keep the bone uh, wet um, in, uh, in similar regards to otology, where you try to eggshell and blue line everything uh, before actually uh, flicking over there. something. Yeah, there is also an irrigating attachment to this drill. It can very easily be irrigation, which is something I think a lot of people like to use as well. So that's a that's a great option. So here I'm just trying to peel off the bone. I'm not biting it. I haven't done the best job of thinning it, but I'm going to thin it and then peel it off and grasp it. See if I can follow my osteotomy up here. There's um, um, a good question from the audience. Uh, has COVID changed our attitude towards motorized instruments? Uh, and or quarry. And I think Dr. Gardner was going over earlier that we haven't really changed much of our practice. I know motorized uh, instruments have been proposed as um, a means of potentially spreading uh, uh, the aerosol even further and potentially um, increasing the risk of, of spreading the infection. But um, we have not changed Harrison. our practices. Um, uh, based on that. Um, yeah, you know, there, there have well, been one or two studies. 
uh, I think uh, Dr. Blyer's group looked at this and found some evidence of aerosolization, just looking at spray of, uh, again, uh, fluorescence actually outside the nose. We actually were not able to reproduce that uh, quite the same, um, even with powered instruments. What we found is that there, while there is some minor spray, we, we used a, uh, there's a, I can't remember the name of it right now, irrigation is a very high tech instrument that's designed to detect even, uh, uh, you know, single micron uh, aerosol, which is what you worry about with, with COVID. And that's clogged. It's a particle diffuser. The particle diffuser. There you go. Eric Smarter, I mean, he remembers that stuff. So we used a particle diffuser and checked outside the nose and basically found that there was minimal, there was minimal, if any, uh, this one's clogged too. There was minimal uh, spray. And then when we brought a suction in, that there was no aerosolization outside the nose whatsoever. So I found that to be very, very reassuring. You know, we obviously had those concerns, especially after a lot of initial reports, irrigation. But I haven't seen a lot of follow-up reports on you know, uh, uh, physicians or surgeons getting uh, COVID from doing surgery. We felt safe doing again, you know, poor Dr. Wong ends up doing a lot of the COVID surgeries here, you know, whether it's epistaxis or trauma, et cetera, drill. And uh, so far he's been safe. So he's our, he's our guinea pig, our canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we feel very safe doing it. And I think uh, equally or more important, so I don't think the risk is extremely high we're able to test patients and we have proper PPE of uh, just wearing N95s. We're not doing anything more than that. N95 and typical surgical gowns. And I think it's um, important to understand the um, advantages of endonasal surgery and not change our indications. Oh, so then we're going based to on that. Um, they have access to Zoom through their PIT email. Mary, Mary, oh, okay. We um, can, Mary Jo, I think we can hear you, Karison. Um, another... Uh, Dr. Out that Dr. The one thing we have modified in our endonasal surgeries, Dr. Zenonos, is we do keep an extra suction port in the in the nose. Drill. So under these Good protective point. sleeves, we do Drill. keep an extra suction. We keep that tracheal suction going the whole time. I don't know. I mean, we have some cadaveric data for it to support that. We don't have inpatient live data. Our numbers of COVID haven't been tremendous here in, in our area of the United States. But uh, we feel that that may help us and keep us safer. And as Dr. Gardner pointed out, we do use Irrigation. all the standard um, precautions that everyone else uses, which include eye protection, um, gowning, N95 masks. We're not a PAPR institution, so we don't um, we don't use a lot of PAPRs, but we use N95s, I think, with a great deal of success. And uh, Dr. Gardner and I have had to do a pituitary apoplexy together in this setting, and actually, I think the patient did quite well. Yeah. Uh, we got it done quickly and efficiently, and our, our team and ourselves, I think, we're pretty safe in that setting. Yeah, we don't switch but, out you know, uh, scrubs and that kind of thing. And we don't have uh, trainees on that, but, and I think that, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, the point is that we've done over a hundred skull endonasal skull based surgeries easily in the pandemic, Garrison, and, and haven't had any incidents where it was a problem. And so I think changing your approach, you know, doing a craniotomy where you normally wouldn't do a craniotomy for that reason, I think is a, I don't, I think it's a mistake. So right now I've thinned the bone laterally over the carotid artery. We don't have the whole carotid exposed, but I'm going to work to do that. And this gives me access to the whole cavernous sinus here. Again, I'm not biting the bone. I'm thinning it and removing it to it, Terry. Dr. Gardner, can you show us the, the Doppler? There's actually a question from the audience yeah. about whether it's, uh, uh, we routinely use a Doppler. Uh, there's an excellent uh, miniaturized Doppler that's um, was yeah, you read, I was literally, literally about to uh, pull it out because I think we have a beautiful example of the protuberance here. You can hear it. That's routinely used in this surgery. And always, even without us asking, it's uh, routine. Well, I, think, I think you certainly navigation is good. The IC green is fantastic, but it's not, uh, you know, it really gives you a uh, picture, which is uh, very important. Uh, surgeons are visual. But I think if you can Doppler it, it means that you really understand the course of that artery. And I think that's as important as anything is proving to yourself exactly what the course of the artery is. Of course, like IC green, you have to learn how to use Doppler. Follow me up a little bit. Make sure that you, you know, are perpendicular to the arteries or you won't hear it. Harrison. You see how Dr. Gardner is following that C shape of the carotid is actually we're going way lateral. 
Uh, again, to get on that uh, anterior wall, the, the cavernous sinus, this is actually one of the safest uh, places to expose the cavernous sinus because the adventitia of the, the artery uh, and the periosteal layer uh, are coming apart. Um, that's one of the safest okay. areas, at least um, in our hands, to, uh, to expose the uh, current sinus. So this gives me pretty good control over this, surgifone. Little bleeding from the lateral edge of the cavernous there, or superior, really coming up on the superior fissure there. Get a half by half. Dr. Gardner, was that uh, 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 an attenuated uh, middle clinoid? Uh, there uh, may be a minor one, uh, nothing major here. I still have to remove the medial OCR. Middle clinoid would be right there. The medial OCR is here. That's sort of our keyhole, Garrison, for endonasal craniotomy. Now, I'm just going to smooth this out. You see that little spike of bone there? That makes me a little nervous on the lateral edge of the carotid. Let me get a pituitary, just because I, I know I'm going to be retracting this artery to resect that wall, and I don't want to retract it against something like that, a little spike of bone. Yep. All right. That little spike while you're at it. Uh, let me get the uh, plate, plate dissector here. What are the landmarks that you really want to see uh, when you're doing a, a resection of the medial wall? Um, let me see that plate dissector again. So basically in this situation, I'm exposing the entire carotid because I know I'm going to get to the infracellar ligament and I know I need to get all the way up to the distal ring. And that requires really a full exposure of the carotid all the way from this paraclival, upper paraclival, all the way up to the OCR. I'd say those are my main landmarks. Uh, this is the part that maybe is not as obvious is making sure we expose this lower part. Right. Uh, and I think it's very important pituitary. You know, we talk a lot about the medial OCR and the importance of exposing the uh, paraclinoidal carotid by doing that. But I think this lower part is equally or more important drill. So now I need to, uh, uh, pituitary got a little mucosa I left behind there. Now I just, because I'm gonna do, plan to do uh, a relatively radical resection here. I want to also expose the tuberculum. Ah, to it here, leaving a little. I want to remove the tuberculum and expose the SIS, the superior intercavernous sinus. Drill. And then what? also the medial OCR. Obviously, you want to avoid a leak up here if I can. It requires just doing an osteotomy up here. Important to note that uh, this patient has a very well uh, developed clival recess. But if in cases where um, this is not as well developed, like as in a conjunct partner of pneumatization, uh, we would have developed this clive of recess again to expose that very uh, proximal, uh, that very distal part clive corroded at the floor of the cella uh, in order to be able to have uh, better access again to that um, anterior and inferior wall, the cavern yeah. behind. Very sensitive to smudge, isn't it? Touch. Here I'm coming right up onto the medial aspect of the optic in order to remove this medial OCR. Now, you'll notice, and Dr. Wan, you want to comment on, you know, we don't use a, an endoscrub, although I think they can be very effective. But we've just sort of always done hand irrigation and use that instead. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I think, you know, endoscrub is, is a fine tool if that's what your team is used to. I don't think there's really anything wrong with it. We like the ability to kind of direct this irrigation where we need it, kind of supplements our view sometimes. But it ends up, um, I mean, there's a little bit of practice with it. It's not tremendous, but I think the clarity associated with not having an extra lens on the scope is, is really nice, especially when you get to the intradural portions. Yeah, that's a good point. Dr. We also think perhaps there's some advantage to the constant irrigation from a hemostatic standpoint <clears throat> because it's warm irrigation and also maybe from an antiseptic standpoint. Dr. Gardner, uh, there's a question from the audience. Can you uh, uh, point exactly where the medial OCR is? I think you're doing it right now. Sure. So yeah. it's this right there, this bone right there, I'm drilling just above it onto the optic canal. <clears throat> and so this is our medial OCR right here. And I'm going to take a kerosene now and <clears throat> hopefully peel out the tuberculum from this. That's the left medial OCR there across the tuberculum. 
just take a quick look at that. Oh, I think I stepped on it. There we go. So right there, that's my kerosene on the medial OCR. So here I'm going to see if I can peel out the tuberculum. Maybe I haven't thinned it quite enough. Not quite there, have I? So there's our medial OCR right there. But I need to thin the tuberculum more to peel that out. <clears throat> so I'm actually doing an osteotomy just above the tuberculum on the prechiasmatic sulcus. And the reason is that the tuberculum is very thick. So it's easier, I find, to thin just above it and peel the whole tuberculum out. This corner is difficult, the contralateral corner, because it's a little, the instrument blocks the view actually of the contralateral needle OCR. You can obviously use an angled scope, but I just slow down a little bit on that part. And the nerve doesn't actually enter the canal until the optic strut itself. Curve on my suction tip. Do a nine, please. Now you see, like most of skull based surgery, this is a lot of preparation, a lot of exposure. I want to wet that bone so I can tell when I'm through it. Blue lining it, that looks pretty good. But all this exposure is going to make my tumor resection. It's going to give me the ability to move freely inside the cella. Kerosene. Not quite through there, am I? It's a really thick to work on. Yep, drill. So I'm struggling with that side. I'm going to peel out this medial OCR because I've actually thinned that. So that's part of the tuberculum and the medial OCR coming out. Irrigation, black tip. Surge of foam. Just some minor bleeding from the SIS, which I can pack off half a half. Yeah, interestingly, the smaller a tumor is, uh, sometimes it, it can make the exposure harder. Uh, Harrison? Especially um, the medial OCRs in a tumor that has not expanded the cell that much can be a little bit more developed. And occasionally you may have to um, expose the very proximal um, uh, optic nerves in the prechiasmatic uh, sulcus as well as the carotids in order to Might get a to remove. Very true. Also, you know, the venous plexuses are, are the venous sinuses are much more patent on bipolar. They're not compressed by tumor. So you get a lot more bleeding from the superior cavernous sinus, from the cavernous sinus, et cetera. Irrigation. This just keeps getting clogged. You got that nine? Okay. Clogged. All right, so let me get a big bulb irrigation. We're going to take one round of irrigation just to really dry things up. Uh, just a little bit of run in. Another thing about the nasal sleeves is that I think we don't realize a lot of times how we traumatize the ethmoids or the lateral nasal wall or the middle turbinate. Just bring our instruments in and out blindly. Big bulb. We're, we're not as uh, cognizant of it on the blind side. Stubby left. And that lack of trauma because of those protective sleeves, I think, really helps. All right, so we're going to do, and a pituitary, we're going to do another IC green run here with the Rubina pituitary. 
and one of the, a couple of reasons behind it. One, again, really see that carotid artery well. I think you can still use that other five cc's you have. Don't have to mix up a new one. But why don't we get it one more set of it so we can look at the flap at the end, get one more vial of it, irrigation. And then I'm going to switch to uh, Fukushima suctions. Why don't we, so I think the, yeah, exactly. Becomes difficult, you know, <laughs> we always talk about how do you keep the, the view straight and you have to sort of, it's a discussion, how do you agree on what's up and what's down and what's uh, straight and what's not. The SIS is a great landmark. The floor of the cell here is not a good landmark, irrigation, because the tumor is displacing it. And you want to really have that orientation because we want to know where the carotid is. I'm pretty happy with our, uh, let us know when you're ready to uh, inject. Go ahead and inject, please. So I can keep operating. I'm going to leave the icy green on for this part. We should see this carotid come in very nicely. I'm going to take the, re the retractable blade from the store set. It's usually about 30 seconds, but right on cue. There we go. You can see how there's some cavernous blood over the carotid here, and here the carotid is very directly exposed. You can see some venous blood coming in now. This is a big superior intercavernous sinus there. We're going to have to deal with that. I may just open that early, Eric, and uh, pack yeah, it off. Yeah. Just to, we can. I'm not sure I fully appreciate that until I see it lighting up here. You can see how the whole upper half, as Dr. Zanonos was talking about, the cell itself is actually uh, not as compressed uh, the tumor, with a smaller tumor, and you have to deal with that sinus more. Interface. Yeah, I think that's a good point. We're seeing a really good tumor interface even before opening the dura. I'm going to go ahead and open right over that sinus, I think. Just deal with it. Get it over with. I'll take some surge of foam. So remember, the sinuses are formed by the dual layer of uh, dura. Periosteal and meningeal layers. I like to fill it just like that. Irrigation. Now I know that my sinus is basically occluded. I have I'm, I'm not using this as a topical. I'm actually embolizing that sinus. Scissor left, the, the store is curly scissor left. Run it down on me. And inter another imp interesting thing that I didn't really quite um, uh, realize is that uh, the, um, the gel foam the, that we use to, to embolize is we, we make our own um, uh, mix. Do it here. Uh, and it tends to be a little bit thicker Surgeon than uh, other commercially available ones, so just for example, surgery flow. Um, and that tends to work it's a little closer. It's got something in it. For the cavern assignment. <clears throat> when it's too thin, uh, sometimes it doesn't tend to work as well, or it can run uh, much further than you actually want it to. Yeah, we like the flexibility of just being able to mix up our own. But it does, you know, you have to have, you have to have uh, techs like we have Sean today who know what the heck they're doing. Irrigation <laughs> makes things look very smooth, even though there's a lot going on behind the scenes there. We're very fortunate to have the same teams, you know, almost every day. We talk uh, about the learning curve, scissor left, but we don't often talk about the learning curve when it comes to you your whole team. ITG one more time. So that's a, that's a, a straight. Left. Kind of went into it now. Yeah, so we'll see once we get the dura open if we can differentiate gland from tumor. Just going to open the dura here. I think it'll slightly slime, I think, unfortunately. Yep. Wipe that, please. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about your dural opening in a case like Certainly. this versus a macroadenoma, which expands everything? Yeah, great. Yeah, great point. I would just, I would normally, I like an inverted V for a macroadenoma, an upside down V. But here, I'm actually opening to the left, sort of curving around the irrigation, the tumor, so that my opening actually avoids the tumor, bipolar. So that's actually the septal artery right there. Ed Laws described that as a, a midline, nice midline landmark, and that shows how far off midline we are on and intentionally here. Scissor left. 
So I'm trying to open now into the inferior intercavernous sinus. Scissor left. I'm going to open into the inferior intercavernous sinus. That's mostly packed off as well. Take that bipolar back. And then we'll open the inner layer of vera irrigation on bipolar. Bipole. So we got to be pretty meticulous with our opening here on. Scissor left. Fine with a scissor left, I can do almost everything I want to do. There are some questions from the audience. Um, we'll try and go um, through yeah. them. Is um, so usually when when we do um, a resection of the cavernous sinus, does this mean that we do a transpterygoid approach uh, on that uh, ipsilateral side? Um, that is a great question. Uh, we we don't do a formal transpterygoid unless we're going just for the medial wall resection. But if we're going into the lateral compartments, then yes, we do. So for this, we didn't quite do a transterior, but we sure came close. You want to show the exposure? So here's our vidian, but Eric has, uh, Dr. Wong has not quite opened up the maxillary sinus. We'd have to open up right back out here. So he's not quite opened it, but we can see this is where a pterygoid palatine is coming in. And I even drilled a little bit of bone of the medial wedge here. So it's, it's just shy of it. Pretty close, actually, but not quite. So the short answer is no. But uh, we maximize our medial, ex our lateral exposure. Uh, another, important, another important point uh, is that, again, if you're a right handed surgeon. Cellar dura for permanent. If you're a right handed surgeon doing a, a right cavernous sinus approach, uh, sometimes you can get away again with, uh, or many, the majority of the times you can get away with putting the flap even on that side without doing a full transperigoid just because you're coming cross court. Uh, but if, if you're in the ipsilateral side that your instruments are coming on, that becomes a little bit more difficult. So great example, even though this is bleeding a little bit, look how, so remember on an MRI, the tumor enhances less than the gland. You can see the gland tumor interface because look at the degree of enhancement. Why don't you come a little closer there? This is a beautiful example of, we can really confirm that there is tumor and there is gland because it's enhancing more. And this is a little bit of delayed uh, Thing that happens, but I find sometimes, for example, for microadenomas in Cushing's where you're really searching, this can be very useful. So I think we have a very clear idea where's tumor, where's gland. Very helpful. Let me get a feather blade. So now I'm actually going to open the cavernous sinus just so we've dealt with that because I know I want to look at that medial wall at least. This little blade's nice because I can see it through the dura, so I know I don't have the artery. I know I haven't hooked the artery. I know I have control over it. Surgifone. Bleeding from the medial cavernous uh, is a good sign. It tells me that it's not completely full of tumor. Of course, I have to deal with that bleeding, but that's okay. Forset, please. Scissor left. Peeling down towards our infracellar ligament. Just really want to see that dura open up there. Okay. Scissor left. Irrigation. One of the interesting things about, you know, the collaboration and skull-based surgery between ENT and neurosurgery is that ENT and head and neck surgery has very different tumor concepts than we do in neurosurgery. And I find that if you apply those same concepts, bipolar, to things like, uh, I can not believe that bleeding, things like chordoma or pituitary tumors, you understand, feather blade, the uh, invasiveness of some of these tumors better. 
is they really are, they're all head and neck tumors and they have the ability to invade surrounding connective tissues. Not something we think about uh, as much perhaps in neurosurgery. Well, Dr. Gardner, um, we Scissor are lock. using this instrument. Um, uh, it's a blunt with a, the backbiter. How far can you go up um, dissecting over the uh, the two walls of the cavernous sinus safely without getting into the carotid? Yeah, great question. So I could go maybe another couple millimeters, but it's very important to understand where the dura here attaches. Right here at the clinoid, up right at the medial OCR, it's going to attach to the distal dural ring right about here. So I can open up to there, but really no more on, because there will be the dura will attach to the carotid. Off, and we're seeing, starting to see it attach here. This is part of the carotidoclinoidal ligament irrigation. And we'll see that better. Let's go ahead and start working on the tumor now. And then we can see the cavernous a little better after that. Bleeding here still. Bipole. On. Surgifone. Mm -hmm. Here I'm using it a little more topically and, and a little more ineffectively. Um, just a, um, a logistics comment. Unfortunately, uh, we're not able to um, to talk about uh, brands and uh, of, of different instruments during this broadcast because of uh, the university limitations, but uh, we'll be happy to answer any other questions. Um, if you um, will be more happy to get in touch with you later on another instance and uh, discuss uh, instruments and things like that. So here I want to try to open, this is the capsule of the pituitary itself. Let me get that retractable blade. It's, it's not tight, tight enough. So. Okay. All right, so here I'm going to try to open onto, I want to see gland itself. Scissor left. You can see the, the way the gland bleeds there. I cut, didn't mean to cut into it, but I did. Get back just a millimeter. No, so I want to try to open this and find this margin with the tumor. Again, I have a flap so I can dissect and resect from the diaphragma and not worry so much. Keep an eye on my carotid, make sure I know where that is. I see gland all the way up there. Good. Get some surge foam again. I'm looking for that gland tumor interface here. Can we lower the bed and put her back up a little more? Just try to bring down the venous bleeding a little bit. Irrigation. It was about the um, put the back up a whole lot. The bipolar setting. Uh, we usually use the the bipolar, especially the the Very one thank you. Uh, on the uh, irrigation uh, on the soft tissues themselves. We usually use them on the malice Four set. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, like with microsurgery, I use the, the malice setting. It's on the 35 uh, setting, 35 uh, current, I guess. Yeah, it can change a little bit depending on where we are. If it's completely intracranial, we can left. lower. If you, it's in the sign, a little bit higher. Right. As we move in here, we'll probably turn it down to 25 as I move into on the gland and not wanting to. damaging the gland. So here you can see I'm just opening this capsule. This is the fibrous capsule of the pituitary. 
And you can see the tumor starting to poke through there. So there's not a plate dissector, not always, um, you know, with a soft tumor, you can't always get an extra capsular dissection, but it doesn't mean you can't dissect the capsule. Force up. So there's clearly the plane between the two. Such a soft tumor like this does not is not going to have a capsule. So no question about that, but doesn't mean I can't dissect the capsule. It just means I'm not going to have a nice, you know, on block piece of tumor coming out, but I can still find the capsule. I can still dissect it. We're going to need some stringless uh, tacos. So I really feel confident that that's my capsule there. I can see that. Very nice. Now I'm going to debulk the tumor some since I see that. I don't want to lose my specimen here. I think I have to wipe the yeah. <clears throat> scissor left. I'm going to take some irrigation. Add a little bit of, of gland with it, which is not a big deal at all. Rather get gland than leave tumor. Let's see the plate dissector for a moment. Look how the tumor, how the gland bleeds. The tumor does not. The gland has all arterioles in it. The tumor has more of a, a sort of a venous ooze that it gets. Can you extend this a little bit for me? Now I want to start getting into this space. I think I need to debulk this a little bit because it's so soft. I'm just going to debulk it with my suction if I don't do it intentionally. So let me get a pituitary. <clears throat> Here's some tumor for, uh, you can send it for permanent mm -hmm. pituitary. And then this is just the debulking of the tumor so I don't suction it all up. Very soft tumor so we can't, keep the tumor intact per se while we do an extra capsular dissection, but I can still do an extra capsular scissor left. So again, I want to inspect my capsule, very happy with it. I'm going to resect the dura along with it, along with the tumor. Taking a little bit of a cuff of gland there intentionally as a margin. Take the four set back now, please. <clears throat> and you see, we're really doing everything we can to recapitulate microsurgery here. Scissor left. A little bit of the caps I'm leaving behind there, so I want to take that. Let's just look for a minute. Great example. Look at the gland. Look at the tumor. No question. Now, granted, we can tell with uh, white light for the most part, but if you can't, there's no question how this shows you the difference between the two, and and especially when you're just first starting to do this, or in any case that's challenging, like a microadenoma. Every little piece of information that you have like that is important. So this is a beautiful example of how that differentiation uh, takes place by using the endocyne green uh, during surgery. Force up. And again, this ability to overlay with the Rubina with the dual cameras really is, is pretty slick. To it, Terry. Obviously, posterior gland starts to come into play in a little bit, not quite yet, but <clears throat> just going to peel out a little bit more so I can see the floor of the cella better. I know that's tumor. All right, that's a little bit stuck, so. All right, force up. Surge of foam. As long as I'm outside the capsule, I'm okay injecting a little bit here to stop some of that bleeding. Don't want to do it if I'm not sure of that irrigation because then I can just basically inject into the tumor and lose my capsule. 
the extra capsule takes a lot of patience, but I, I think it's worth it. And if you're going to offer a patient like this with a functional tumor surgery, you need to be prepared to deal with that. All right, scissor left. Nice release of the capsule of tumor there. There's going to be our posterior gland right there. We've left it intact. Right there is posterior gland. See if how that should light up a little different. Coming closer there. The posterior gland doesn't quite light up the same as you would expect. <clears throat> Cut out this floor dirt yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, might as well. I'm going to leave it it's somewhat intact just so we show those ligaments better. But So now I need to start to dissect the medial wall here. And I think we can see the tumor really invading medial wall here, no question. Uh-huh, please. Surge of foam. This whole medial wall is invaded. It may... It, Almost, it's so invaded here, it looks like there's not a medial wall, but there is. Felt forcep, or the forceps, not felt. The medial wall is full of tumor. So this is all medial wall here, completely invaded with tumor, and we can tell that because there's the carotid itself. So here I'm dissecting medial wall of cavernous from the carotid. I'm going to go ahead and cut this inferior paracellular ligament. Scissor left. This is really stuck, isn't it, huh? Very stuck. Not surprising, I guess. That's what I get. What I asked for, huh? Force up. So this is starting to invade here the anterior compartment. These compartments are named based on their relationship to this genu of the carotid. So this is anterior to that genu, so it's starting to invade that. Peeling it off of there. Dr. Gardner is looking for that inferior hypophysial artery that's hopefully going to come into view. It'll come into view one way or the other, that's for sure. Right. Scissor left. Hopefully in a more controlled fashion, huh? The thing you don't want to do is, is avulse that artery. There we go, nice release of our inferior paracellular ligaments. Force up. And I want to see the carotid a little better. There we go. Yeah. So that I can more confidently cut those ligaments. So I'm debulking a little bit. And I think there can be no question here that this medial wall is invaded. So, you know, the question is how can you tell? I think the endoscope and opening the wall and looking at it, something we're maybe not used to do, doing, but I think has value. Scissor left. Oh, that anterior compartment is really more invaded than I suspected, huh? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> a lot more. Now, both the anterior and the superior compartment don't have any nerves in them. Don't need to worry about that. I may come back for that little remnant there. Just a surgifone. That's some venous bleeding. Tells me I've opened into the posterior compartment. I can tell it's venous because it's it's not quite under pressure. It's dark and it. The lack of pulsatility doesn't always help me, but irrigation. But the color and the pressure does. Scissor left. Focusing in. It needs to be very dependent on distance here. Yeah, that's great. 
So I'm no, I'm leaving a little bit there, but I want to see the carotid better before I resect that portion. Here I'm following back towards the inferior paracellar. It's a very ectatic carotid too, isn't it? And you see that what we're, what we're discussing about earlier, exposing that floor of the cella uh, and that very proximal part of clavicle. Critical, yeah. Yeah, it's so, so critical to do this. So here now I'm getting onto the bipolar, onto the, you could on 25 on the bipolar. I'm getting onto the carotidoclinoidal ligament that's coming across here, and it's really not just one on, not just one ligament, but a couple of them. Scissor. This is an excellent question from the audience. Um, in terms of blunt versus sharp of, uh, uh, of the medial cavernous sinus wall um, from the carotid artery. And uh, Dr. Garner will comment on that, but you can see he's actually using a combination of it, never pulling too far so that he can particularly have off something. something much of it is a, is a feel uh, how much you're actually pulling, but you have to dissect and then sharply divide those ligaments. Paul? Yeah, I, I, in general, I prefer sharp dissection. I think it's more precise. Um, obviously, that has the downside of being able to cut, but it's better than tearing it, I think. Wow, this artery is just totally. a, a real pain. That is really challenging to follow the course of that artery. I'm going to leave it a little bit there, and we'll come back for that. Let's come up here a little bit better. Light the scope or something. Just not getting a great irrigation. <clears throat> Let me see that uh, feather blade one more time. I'm going to open up a little higher to the uh, to the distal dural ring. It's a half hour. Scissor left. Bipolar. Great. On. Off. Yeah. On. Scissor left. This is more of that carotid oclinoidal ligament trying to release here. It's really getting involved, isn't it? Yeah. There we go. That's looking a little bit better. Just walking up the carotid here. Now we need to find our superior paracellar ligament attachment, forcep. Getting there. So I'm just peeling the medial cavernous wall off until I see those ligamentous attachments and then I cut them. That's why it's important to understand what and where those ligaments are. Still struggling a little bit with that carotid oclinoidal one right there. But we're making progress. Yeah, look how that carotid loops in there, huh? It really does come in. What a pain. Not making our life easy. Coming closer. Yeah. Peel this down from the superior paracellar ligament. You see the superior margin here? 
There you go. Some people worth noting is how Dr. Wong is is going back and forth, you know, using dynamic um, endoscopy. He's constantly giving Dr. Gardner in view. Um, it's it's really hard to do this uh, with the fixed um, endoscope. I would say almost impossible. I would say you can't you can't do cavernous wall dissection with that technique. There's just no way, not safely. Scissor left. I can't anyway. Hold back. So I'm going to release this now medially. Don't want to forget this margin medially. I'm going to take a little cuff of tumor of a gland here and make sure I don't leave any tumor behind. There we go. Force up. <clears throat> and this should touch right where the distal ring meets the diaphragma. Scissor left. Force up. <clears throat> Definitely a situation where we're going to measure about three or four times and cut once. I can feel I'm back on the posterior dura. I'm going to peel this out so I see it a little better. Wow, that was really stuck there. Yep. Scissor. There's a question about um, the preparation of patients in this uh, uh, pandemic for COVID-19, if this if it's PCR routinely used um, before doing this. Um, yeah, we we tend to uh, check every patient. Uh, or so. At least uh, uh, two days ahead of uh, surgery and make sure they're negative. Moved a little more towards antigen testing, and we're trying to understand if that's equivalent or not. Oh, that is stuck. Yeah, it used to be PCR. <sighs> Changing. Scissor. I think we're seeing a little bit of bleeding from a hypothesis. Let me see the bipole. On. Really sticky. Scissor. Back just a hair. I'll lose track of the artery. Now, this carotid clinoid ligament is just really. I'm going to trim this. And come back and look at that. There's an attachment of the carotid clinoidal there that I just don't have a good feel for it. It's boundary with the carotid. So, I'm going to release this bit of tumor. 
resect the cellar floor and maybe poster clinoid dura attached to it. And then go back to that carotid clinoid. Not quite as clean as I would like, but uh, I think safer is better. Do it here. This is going to be medial cavernous wall. So that's the majority of the medial cavernous wall peeled down there. I've left a little bit of the carotid clinoidal and superior paracellar ligaments. And now we'll go back and look at those irrigation. Bipole, what's that? Yeah, it was a wise Yeah, I'd like to make it look pretty, but sometimes better to be safe. A little bit of bleeding from the intrapophyseal again. On bipole. Off. Off. On. Third phone. Put some slack on there if I can. Just packing off that superior compartment, a little bit of venous rundown irrigation. All right, so now we just have, I think, a little bit of involved but attached carotid clinoidal ligament. I'm happy with everything else. Scissor left. Really happy with that scissor left. That's how the gland's teaching up now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great point. The gland sort of plumps up to fill the space, right? Paul, would you consider uh, just coagulating some remnant there instead of resecting it? If Not a bad idea. Um, certainly to consider. I'm sure I will leave some remnant here. Straight scissor. actually looks a little more clean. I don't know. There's some tumor in it. Yeah, never mind. Spoke too soon. Bipolar. Switch to the straight tips after this. On. Off. Irrigation. Let's dry things up. Take a look. See what we got. Definitely some tumor back there, huh? Let's go back to this side. Scissor left. Let's follow that capsule back. A little bit of the dura over the posterior clinoid. Scissor left is uh, involved here. Again, there's our posterior gland. That's just posterior dura. Dura over the posterior clinoid. The diaphragma looks pretty clean there, don't you think? I do. Especially for some of the eight. Think it's taking up too much space, or? I'm riding it pretty hard right now. Back to the posterior clinoid dura there. Boy, that carotid, the way it loops in there, is just making this tough. Really I mean, tough. I don't think normally appeals. Yeah, straight scissor. There's a question from the audience. Um, if there is a problem to leave a positive margin behind, is this is a benign tumor and it's, it's quite sticky. And I think, you know, as Dr. Gardner, we'll see how, how much more we can, Dr. Gardner can do safely. Uh, do it, Terry. If the more that can be resected here in a functional tumor, um, it is important to try and get as much as possible. Although, or again, the priority is to be safe. I think um, there's wis wisdom in that question. Right. Uh, I think I think you're doing everything safely so far, though. Right. There we go. So there now we've drilled, moved the dura over the poster clinoid. Let me see the forcep again. Small amount of uh, residual here. Adherent. I would certainly uh, agree. I would hate to injure her artery in this setting. Scissor left. Now, if you do leave uh, some residual uh, behind, Paul, would you consider putting uh, some fat in between as a spacer? 
Yeah, it's a good good uh, good point. The only thing is that you know we know it's a very slow growing tumor. The the idea is, you know, I think Bill Caldwell and others have reported using uh, surgifoam fat graft if you know you're going to radiate the patient. But I think even if there were some small residual, I don't think I would radiate uh, right off the bat, and so that fat tends to disappear over time. So well, it works in the first three to six months, and uh, you know, radio surgery as an adjunct for this is not a bad option, but. By Muller. Again, she could be on the most, you know, she's not, doesn't mind the symptoms of very minor prolactinemia. So I think for now I wouldn't. Is it worth uh, putting, putting a phaser and doing radio surgery now? Um, given the, the, that there is uh, enough space now that they're actually going to close up later? Ah. Uh, Third foam? Yeah, I think I would not do radio surgery for that, you know, with that little remnant. We'd follow her prolactin levels and see. Such a such a small remnant there and uh, irrigation. I do want to make sure I don't see any, you know, soft tumor. Obviously, that is a remnant of the uh, carotid clinoidal ligament there. Suction. It looks like right here it has a little bit of tumor in it, right there. But again, the crowd wisdom is is to leave it, and I think that that's good wisdom. Pull back just a hair. You see a force up? There we can see how this is really attached there. Feather blade. And a straight scissor. So this is a great example of how if if you know the dura itself come up just a hair higher is invaded, then you know resecting it probably doesn't. This is biologically bipolar, maybe a little different. We have four step actually. Drop down there. How about the uh the gold one, please. A little bend on this force up here. So I can work around the endoscope. Another very good uh, question is, uh, do we use angled endoscopes to uh, look laterally um, in the cavern of sinus? Are you planning to do that a little bit later? Straight scissor. I think there's not much need for it here, to be quite honest. But it's certainly a good technique. So now I'm just going to trim this, I think. I don't think we have much ability to completely. It's just not coming off of there. Bipolar. Up a hair higher. Yep. Ah. <clears throat> Another question now is about scissor. About forty-five uh, scissor. Potential for cranial nerve injury uh, with these maneuvers, uh, both the dissection as well as potentially a little bit of uh, pulling right now. Um, we are monitoring, you know, the uh, all the nerves in the cavern of sinus, and um, Dr. Gardner is making words the cavern is a little bit high. Now. The majority of uh, uh, of the palsies are related to the packing. 
uh, and are usually transient. Um, obviously, having a free run of the EMG in, in the operating room, you can, can see if something yes. is. Uh, the new <clears throat> we haven't had to use the cartoon stimulator. Bipolar? Doesn't want to separate. Nope. So I'm just going to fry this. I do think it's a small amount of involved carotid oclinoidal ligament. Uh, we'll show the stimulation, but the beauty again of this approach and this amount of in invasion of the cavernous is the nerves really are not at risk. On? You know, frustrating and unfortunate that won't come off completely, but I think that I suspect that her prolactin levels will normalize off. On. If this were acromegaly, let's go up to 35, please. If this were acromegaly, I would place a piece of fat here between the gland and the tumor. On. I would place a piece of fat there and do early radio surgery. I think that that is underutilized in residual acromegaly. Irrigation. All right, cartouche, irrigation first. So we're just going to stimulate just to show you where six is going to run here. Two volts, please. Just put my ground in place on the cheek here. Cartouche. The six should be right behind here. There's six in the posterior compartment and then six runs right here in the anterior inferior compartment. So he's just telling me that six is stimulating there, surge of foam. And as Dr. Zanonos mentioned, just a little bit of packing here is the only thing that really provides any risk to six. And we occasionally see some uh, transient Delayed transient six nerve palsy, which always recovers irrigation. We've not given any steroid, and that allows me to, and we won't give any uh, hydrocortisone post op. I'll just check a cortisol level in the morning as long as the patient's stable. More warm water irrigation, and then uh, we'll place the flap up, more irrigation. And we'll do one, why don't we go mix up that last vial of icy green? And then we'll uh, look at the flap with it. I guess we can show the carotid as well. Uh -huh. Bipole. On. Off. Really happy with that capsule there. Very happy with that on. Yeah. Surge of foam. Now I'll take the half by half and then force up one more time. A very uh, good question from the audience. What is the learning curve um, for scalpy surgeries? But I assume for you know performing this maneuver uh, in your views on this. Well, I can tell you that we didn't, I didn't do this a regular one for at least 10 years, this kind of a dissection, 10 years of doing endonasal surgery before doing these kind of dissections, uh, you know, truly resecting the cavernous wall and a functioning tumor. Uh, you know, we would sort of suction it off as best we could. And if it fall, if it went into the cavernous, we would try to follow it there. But resecting that invaded wall, we did not do. Let me get a, a, zero, a 30 degree endoscope, please. 45, 130 or 45? Well, that, 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 that being said, I mean, this is a technique the ICG. that you would just learn how to do a little bit later. Um, do you suggest that there is, you know, it, it requires 10 years of experience to be able to do this? Sorry, what was that? I guess my, uh, my um, comment was that, you know, 10 years ago we didn't, I guess no one used to do this, but do you suggest that someone needs 10 years of experience before being able to do this? Or do you think this is a, a procedure that, you know, with 
with uh, the appropriate training can be done safely by um, majority of I, I do. I, I do, but I guess the the point is that this is not something to jump into uh, unless you know you're prepared to deal with the carotid in its entirety. Come and look right. out the forces. Sure. So here's the superior compartment right there. So again, can you show the based on? Well, can you show the entire course of the carotid? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here's the carotid coming up here, and then curving. There's the posterior genu and the anterior genu. And so here's going to be our superior compartment. There's attachment of the carotid annual ligament. There's the posterior compartment. And there's our anterior inferior compartment. No tumor in the superior compartment, which is the most common. Actually, that was quite clean. This is the bipole. Another question is about the risk of DI. Um, Usually the risk of DI, I would say, is relatively small with a careful dissection uh, like such as this one. Uh, when scope. performing bilateral transcavernous approaches to resect uh, sinoids, that tends to be associated with a little bit more manipulation of the gland. A unilateral um, sacrifice of the um, inferior hypothesial actually has a very low incidence of, of, be, of being associated with a DI. Well, I would say unilateral is almost done. We even looked at bilateral and felt that there were no cases that were based on vascular insult. Right. But rather, maybe manipulation. You know, when you do bilateral and you have a tall, it was the only cases that had any DI surgifoam were patients who had really tall posterior clinoids, which suggests a lot more manipulation of the posterior gland. Posterior gland does not have a capsule around it, so it's a little more sensitive to that. Absolutely. Uh, that being said, I mean, that I think that there's still. Uh, needs to be validated in a large cohort, but that uh, that's been definitely our experience. Third of home. Yeah, I think the risk of DI here should be extraordinarily low. Irrigation. All right, I'm pretty happy with my hemostasis there. You got to be obsessive about it. These last thing I want to do is come back tonight for a clot. To, um, All right, why don't we go and inject the icy green one more time? Irrigation. So, same place you did before, same location. Let us know when you're ready. So, you give all tendencies this time with a 10 cc plus. Yeah. Go ahead. See a little bit of residual still in the gland, which is encouraging. Bipole, please. We see our whole gland lighting up very nicely. On. Again, a little bit of covering of uh, adventitia, uh, not adventitia necessarily, but the uh, uh, cavernous irrigation tissue on the ascending portion. See if we can get closer to the ascending portion, show it light up there. Ascending portion right here. A little closer right down there. There we go. See how dependent it is on distance also. <coughs> All right, certifoam one more time. And irrigation. And pituitary. Now we're going to want to look at our flap to see how it enhances. Pituitary. Pituitary. No, that time. Go ahead. Really nice filling of the pedicle there. A lot of times we like to watch this in real time, but I wanted to see the carotids too. I want to clean off the periosteal side. Again, I can tell the periosteal side from the mucosal side by 
how it interacts with the suction. Okay, those little suction bites on the uh, mucosal side. And what I love about this is I can I can work with this Rubina system. I can work with the IC green on as an overlay. I don't have to switch back and forth to check it. Surge of foam. Dr. Wong, I, I think we're safe to use something absorbable here as a packing. Yeah, we'll probably use that absorbable. But I like that, you know, I know that my that carotid is completely exposed. We do not like to leave that open to the nasal cavity. The it's sphenoids, like yeah, great flap, wow. I don't know if you guys saw that that spur, but the fact that we have this that one little opening there and this and this flap is pretty impressive. Nice job, Dr. Wong. Very nice. Not easy. Okay. Not Good easy point. at all. Great, beautiful coverage. Surge to cell. Absolutely spectacular flap. And we see, come and look at the body real close. Now look, look at the difference. You've got to get close to test the fluorescence. That's, that is, I would say that's a pretty good fluorescence of the flap in the body, and that's going to be a living flap on MRI. So I have no concern for flap necrosis or uh, not having good coverage with that flap. Just absolutely beautiful, uh, beautiful enhancement, certainly the pedicle, but it's distance dependent. So that, a good example of it. You don't see the enhancement until you get the scope right next to the, the body of the flap. You also do have to be a little patient. You know, the artery is kinked off for quite a while. Right. So sometimes it, it's, it's not going to be as robust as the native mucosa, but you can kind of, you have to give it a little bit of time. Uh, but we think that, this, jump on. Sorry. A few more uh, questions from the audience. Um, um, Dr. Bendock um, was uh, questioning about the amount of head extension and whether to use um, uh, pins uh, uh, versus just uh, use uh, stealth um, with, uh, with a mask or an, an electromagnetic system. Yeah, I, I think to some degree that's your, that's your uh, preference. Uh, I like uh, pins because I know I can hold the patient's head twisted toward me. It's more comfortable for me. Um, and uh, I also know there's no chance of them moving while I'm drilling or doing that dissection right over the carotid artery. The head won't wiggle. Uh, I like that stability of the head and the rotation of the head that I get with pins. And so as a result, I don't use a mask or something like that. But, but I think that's very personal preference. And the, the degree of head extension, I, I, would, I would say is uh, depending on the on the case, obviously, for a case like we're going to do next, uh, like creviform case, you need more extension for something going lower, the less extension, but a little bit of extension is helpful. Just so, just so everyone's aware, we have a second case that we are doing. Uh, I don't know if we want to switch over and discuss that second case now. This is not the only case. Mary John, if there's a way to send out a message also to some people who may have dropped off. Uh, but we do have a second case we're going to flip over to now, anesthesio neuroblastoma. Uh, so there are, um, Dr. Zanonos, if you want to maybe take over your screen and start discussing that case. Uh, sure, just to tackle real quickly a couple more questions. Uh, the, there was a question about glue. We have stopped using it for flaps and we haven't seen um, a difference. Uh, it was more of a cost savings uh, attempt. Uh, it just seemed like something that just didn't add anything. Um, Yeah, we actually studied that. We didn't find a difference in leak rates, um, studying 100, 100, 150 cases with uh, and, and similar number without glue and had no difference whatsoever in the leak rate. So it was, uh, we felt an unnecessary cost. Right, there's a question about uh, fat to plug the cella defect. Uh, for something like this, we, I think I would say that we feel is unnecessary. Uh, there, there is a role, as we said, to put a fat plug just to separate it. If you're planning to do radio surgery right after, uh, but just for uh, reconstructive purposes, we, we just don't feel that this is necessary usually. Um, 
and also it creates issues if you ever need to go back. All right, any other questions? I, if not, we should switch over to the... Uh, it was also like one last question about potential skip, skip lesion, lesions, especially with Cushing's disease or something like that, um, uh, you know, relevant to this case. Certainly this case seemed like a very defined um, uh, lesion, uh, but for Cushing's cases, um, they're they are rare, but they're possible. Uh, Paul, do you have experience with such, such cases before we switch over? That's the last, uh, that's the last yeah, question. It's, it's awfully hard to tell when there are skip lesions. You know, imaging isn't going to tell you. I think the obvious thing is if you take out a tumor and you really feel confident about your extracapsular dissection and the patient still doesn't crash, doesn't drop their cortisol levels and show that they are uh, cured of disease or at least in remission, then you have to go back and look for other areas. Um, I think the IC green is very helpful uh, with that and the fluorescence. If I see several areas that look similar to tumor in their fluorescence pattern, then those are ones that I would uh, consider resecting. I think you always just have to keep a suspicion for it. I can't say that there's, I have any brilliant idea as to how to be sure about it, but uh, extra capsular dissection helps and IC green helps detect that. All right, excellent. Um, so we're just gonna switch over. I'm gonna take control of the screen um, and uh, just start going over our second case. And once we're done with that, um, we're going to switch over to the other room. Just one second to switch over. All right. Um, so we should have this started from the beginning. So we'll skip forward. <clears throat> so um, our second case um, uh, refers to a 45 year old a uh, woman who presented with a uh, one year of nasal congestion. Um, she um, uh, had uh, ineffective treatment with the congestions and she uh, ended up uh, being scoped and where a nasal mass was uh, was seen. This was bi biopsied um, uh, a little bit more than a month ago. Um, the path was consistent with uh, anesthesia and neuroblastoma. Uh, this was a Hames uh, grade two uh, with a relatively low proliferated index. However, there, were, there was presence some, uh, there was presence of some necrosis. Um, this was, however, isolated and didn't push the grade to be a grade three. Uh, she had uh, a, a CT angiogram and an MRI, which will show uh, the um, imaging as well as the physical exam of the neck did not reveal any adenopathy. Uh, nor did the remainder of the, um, of the imaging show any distal metastases. So uh, she was an N0 um, and then um, a low, uh, low aggressiveness tumor from what current we can understand so far. Uh, she was scheduled to have a, a dotted PET scan. Um, however, um, uh, there were some um, technical issues and uh, she unfortunately hasn't gotten it still. Um, this is the imaging. Um, you can see on the T2 here, there's a, um, this, this mass that's uh, filling the nasal cavity um, and um, it's extending to uh, intracranially um, through the criminal plate and therefore we have medialis, uh, so the K to C uh, tumor. Uh, you can see the contrasted images here as well. Uh, again, this is sagittal image. Uh, you, you can see um, uh, extension of the tumor through the cribriform uh, and on the coronal as well. Um, you do see the inferior part of the septum uh, that is uh, partly pushed inferiorly um, and uh, there's at least part of it that is not involved and we'll discuss a little bit with Dr. Snyderman uh, what his thoughts are in terms of uh, reconstruction uh, for a tumor like this so whether you go um, at least try to uh, preserve uh, a nasal septal flap and try that as a reconstruction versus uh, trying some alternative um, approaches such as an extracranial pericranial flap, uh, which is a very common uh, reconstructive means and works very well for this kinds of, uh, of tumors. Uh, this is also again uh, a blown up view of uh, a coronal contrasted image as well as a T2 showing uh, the extension of the 
the tumor in the intracranially. Uh, we actually had uh, created uh, this uh, uh, 3D printed models that allow us to understand the anatomy a little bit better. Um, is the see-through model on the left side and, and uh, uh, another one on the right side that shows uh, the bony anatomy uh, in a more detailed fashion. Um, Dr. Snyderman actually makes the, the most use of it. Uh, he spends hours and hours in the observation room uh, contemplating all the minutia um, and the dangers, the booby traps that we can run into um, before going to surgery, but it does allow uh, for all of us to, um, I guess, have a, a better understanding of, of the tumor before going in. Um, so for a tumor like this, obviously, uh, there's a question about the goals of surgery. Um, uh, the goals of surgery is to um, hopefully achieve uh, negative margins in a tumor like this. Um, neurophysiologic monitoring uh, for a tumor like this, as opposed to uh, the prior case, uh, usually um, revolves around uh, just using some other sensory evolved potentials. Um, someone would argue that uh, even that may not be needed. We do tend to use some of the sensory evolved potentials, especially in older tumors. This patient is not that old, um, but we do um, tend to uh, place the patients in some extension uh, in that um, it just gives us an extra layer of safety that we're not extending the patients too much and there's no issue with, um, with their neck uh, being kinked. Uh, in pins. The surgical ma margins in this case is obviously we have to uh, serve margins from everywhere. Um, uh, dural margins uh, um, for sure anteriorly, posteriorly and on the sides, but um, one thing that's over and foregone, uh, the margins uh, on the falks and also the margins on the olfactory um, uh, nerves, uh, and the olfactory tracts um, that have, with, have to be taken as well. This this tumors start um, from there, they can um, they can extend backwards uh, into the nerve, so getting a negative uh, frozen path uh, ensures that we have a complete resection. Uh, we'll speak a little bit more about reconstructive options. Um, again, trying to uh, preserve an aseptic flap in these cases is often uh, very very hard, uh, if not impossible. Uh, sometimes you do get uh, lucky if uh, there's a uni there's unilateral involvement or if the, um, um, the both the vascularity as well as the majority of the flab is pushed um, inferiorly um, and it's enough um, there's enough width um, that could cover uh, our defect um, there's a question of management of the neck um, the our protocol is uh, is to follow again um, uh, both a physical exam uh, uh, imaging beforehand but also get a PET scan in a tumor like this, it does not change um, the management. This, um, this still warrants uh, resection of the primary disease. Um, and um, it's, uh, there's a lot of controversy about adjunctive chemotherapy um, and radiotherapy, um, both the modalities, uh, the length, and, uh, or even neo the use of neoadjuvant therapy. Um, and we'll discuss a little bit more about it. Uh, but obviously, uh, um, a complete resection um, is is always associated with uh, with better outcomes. So um, we're gonna switch back um, to the operating room. And uh, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Steinman, Dr. Gardner, are you able to hear us in the operating room? Hello, can you hear us? Hello, George. George. Yes, yes, we can hear you loud and can clear. Okay, so while while Paul's been having fun in the other room, I've been working hard in here <laughs> with, with my trusty assistant, Katie. And uh, so there were several challenges with this patient. 
One is a, a large, bulky, left-sided tumor, and the other was the nasal septum was severely displaced to the right side. This is a, a low-grade um, olfactory neuroblastoma, Hyams grade two, and so it really had a pushing border. It was not very invasive within the sinus areas. So the first thing I did was assess the nasal septum. There was an area of tumor invasion on the left septum that I excised, but there was no extension of tumor through the underlying bone. And so then I removed the bone of the septum and then I was able to elevate a right-sided flap. So here's, here's a right-sided flap. It's not as big as perhaps I would normally like, but it's almost normal size. So there's my flap. And so hopefully that will be adequate for reconstruction. I took additional frozen sections of the margins of the flap, and so far those have been negative. Small pituitary. Never, never mind. No. And um, and then I proceeded to do a right a sphenoethmoidectomy. Here's the sphenoid sinus on both sides. Here's the cella. You can see a lateral septation going to the right side. Um, there was no tumor involvement of the sphenoid sinus. On the right side, I did a complete ethmoidectomy and de I decompressed the medial wall of the orbit. Here's the anterior ethmoid artery, which is uh, still feeding the tumor, so we're going to sacrifice that. In order to devascularize the tumor, we typically do a medial orbital decompression, and that, that allows us to elevate the periorbita from the uh, orbital roof, and that helps you locate the ethmoidal arteries. It also gives you additional exposure if you need to extend your skull base resection laterally above the orbit. Um, on the left side, I finished the, some sinus surgery here, opening up the left maxillary sinus, but the bulk of the tumor was preventing me from completing my ethmoidectomy. So I had to use a, a bipolar electrocautery to come across the attachments of the tumor from the uh, Christogalli here all the way back to the planum. And so it removed the bulk of the tumor. That now gives me access to the medial wall of the orbit. I removed the medial wall of the orbit. Here's the uh, left anterior ethmoid artery, which is quite large, and we'll sacrifice that in a second also. In this case, the posterior ethmoid arteries really are less of an issue. There's one right there. Um, so I don't know that they need to be sacrificed, um, but, it's, but certainly the ethmoidal arteries anteriorly will help. And then um, I did a, a front, a draft three frontal sinusotomy. So here's the back table of the frontal sinus. I've taken off the floor on both sides, just using a, a curved kerosene rongeurs. Uh, and then we did a little drilling of the bone anteriorly here to give us more access. Um, we can get a little bit more hemostasis here um, of the tumor attachments. And then we can, uh, sacrifice the ethmoidal arteries, and then we can start drilling the bones circumferentially around the tumor. Are there any questions uh, or comments at this point? Dr. Snyder, can you uh, comment a little bit about the role of elective neck dissection um, for, uh, um, for Kadish B tumors um, and their neural factory bulb? So, uh, um, Patients these days should be staged with imaging, not just physical exam. And using the newer uh, uh, PET modalities, uh, um, these days we're using Dotatate uh, PET scans when possible, if not a, an FDG PET with either CT or MR. And if there are sus suspicious lymph nodes, we would recommend doing a neck dissection at the same time. Uh, if the lymph nodes are not suspicious, uh, do not light up on PET, then we would just continue to observe. We would not do an elective neck dissection in everyone. Uh, one exception would be someone with a high grade, uh, high, AMS, uh, high high AMS grade three, four. Uh, those patients have an increased risk of cervical metastases, and you could make, a, make an argument for doing an elective neck dissection in those patients. Can you comment a little bit on uh, your, if, if you were to do that, can you comment a little bit on laterality uh, and how, how um, Dependable that right. is. Well, you know, it's with many tumors in the head neck region, the, um, they metastasize to the same site as the tumor. 
uh, studies have shown with olfactory neuroblastoma that you cannot predict which side of the neck they will metastasize. The most common lymph node area is level two, um, and, um, and then associated areas uh, next to that. Um, so if, you're, if someone has uh, metastases to one side of the neck, that could also be an argument for treating both sides of the neck. All right, so Dr. Gardner has joined me now. You talked about your exposure you've done. Yeah. Um, for a K to C tumor, um, would you ever consider uh, either starting with new adjuvant therapy? There's a question for the audience. Um, Mix up the IC green, please. So if, if a patient has a nine, high grade nine. tumor uh, that is advanced, so a lot of intracranial extension or orbital invasion or <laughs> large cervical metastases, then we would uh, recommend uh, uh, giving nine. induction chemotherapy uh, and then uh, assessing, reassessing. And finally, uh, would you be able to uh, show us again and uh, speak a little bit uh, about the anterior and posterior limits of uh, our resection here? Sure. Paul, Paul's going to show that now. So, you know, Dr. Simon's done a beautiful job of exposing uh, pituitary, basically the entire skull base, in a very short period of time. Um, you can see here, here's our cella, so something that we're all pretty familiar with. There's the right optic. And these esthesios, it's so important to identify the optics because it's very easy to get lost uh, anteriorly. So there's one optic, there's our carotid, there's our OCR, not very well developed. Here's our other optic right there. So I'm gonna take my navigation just to confirm that. Our flap I'm suctioning on. Certainly. So there's our optic. Dead on, very accurate on our coronal, very helpful. Absolutely. So I think that's going to be our easily our posterior uh, area that we need to <coughs> work back toward. Let me see the pituitary. And Dr. Snyderman's done bilateral. So on the side of the tumor, we always want to take the, the medial wall of the orbit as an oncologic margin. On the opposite side, you don't have to. But in this case, we did for access to the ethmoidal arteries. We can see ethmoidals pretty well here, I think. There's the anterior ethmoidal on that side. Oh, great exposure. And then maybe I'll take a caudal here. That's enough. Posteriorly there. Okay. We may, I don't see much of a posterior, do you? Uh, yes, there right it is. There. there it is. Okay. To it, Terry. So why don't we give five cc's of that icy green into whatever IV is closest to the heart? Five cc's followed by a 10 cc flush, please. So we we, we tell me when you're going to give it. Okay, don't give it yet. We prefer. I'm sorry. To, okay. We prefer to sacrifice the vessels on the orbital side because you have more room to work there. Bottle. And you can see that you really can't gain access to the roof of the orbit unless you sacrifice these vessels. You can see how that supply comes right through the orbit. Look at that's beautiful. Look on the other side here. Sure points them out, doesn't it? There's our posterior, there's our anterior. You can't miss them. Shows the posterior even through bone there, it showed through. That's fantastic. Pituitary. Let's look at the our flap for a moment. Now, Dr. Snyderman has Somehow managed to get a nasal septal flap here, which is wonderful for this patient, avoids okay, a cranial up. incision. Look how that beautifully enhances coming right into the pedicle. Nice living flap. I'm gonna tuck it back down, untwist it. Don't want it twisted up down here. So that's very um, promising. If you see a good enhancement like that in the flap pedicle, it's very unlikely you'll have any problems with that flap. Assuming Dr. Gardner doesn't do something with it while he's drilling, huh? All right, there we go. Twist the bed. The angle of our bed is all wrong. I'll just plug this loose. It's okay. Let me just fix this. Everything's sort of a little bit screwy. Just move this and everything for a second. 
All right, we're just adjusting things a little bit. Notice that um, yeah. uh, the spyway, uh, the, the sleeves rather, I'm sorry, the, the protective sleeves that we're using when uh, three cases like this, um, uh, sometimes we pull them out slightly. Normally they're not sticking out that much, but we, we pull them out slightly in order to be able to- um, Put that up on the thing. Up the yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, in this case, because we've Thanks. resected so much of the nasal septum and need to see the whole anterior cranial base, um, the nasal sleeves don't need to be inserted as far. But it allows me to easily pass the scope through without getting the, the scope dirty unless I, I touch something. All right. There's a question about, you know, where it's worth um, exposing the periorbita since they're likely involved. Um, to avoid um, less uh, uh, orbital swelling. I didn't catch all that. About where Res to... Scissor left. About resecting periorbita or... Or exposure of periorbita. Either or. I think the question was about uh, actual resection of periorbita. So, so, you know, we I removed the lamina capricia just by fracturing it and elevating it from the periorbita. If the if the peri, if the medial orbital wall is not invaded by bone, I mean, if the bone is not invaded by tumor, then I, I usually do not resect the periorbita. If the tumor is extending through the bone, then I would take additional periorbita as a margin. So in this case, the bone was intact, and we can preserve the periorbita. Scissor. Just to, just to clarify for the audience that you know the bone is usually um, and a surgical assessment. You you can't really get frozen pathologies on the bone, so. Um. I pull. I'm trying to leave a little stump on there. We actually have two poster ethmoids here. Leave a little stump because I don't want it retracting into the orbit, and causing a retroorbital hematoma on bipole. Certainly one of the risks, and that's why we manage these very early on to make sure that we have them under control. Surgifone. All right, do the same thing on the other side after I pack this off. But a venous bleeding there. Bipole. Talked about your draft and everything. Yeah. On. Just sacrificing and, and ligating these ethmoidals. Here's the anterior ethmoidal. Dr. Zonos, you want to talk about the directionality of the arteries? How to tell which one's which. May have lost him, scissor uh, left. The, the, you can see how this, go ahead. So the ethmoidal arteries diverge from each other Bipole. as they pass from lateral to medial. So notice the anterior ethmoidal artery is projecting anteriorly as it passes medially, and the posterior ethmoidal arteries will do just the opposite. On. But you can see how much additional exposure we're getting to the roof of the oh. orbit if we need to chase a, a, the tumor, um, not only for olfactory oh. neuroblastoma, for a, but for a meningioma that has a dural tail. Irrigation. Now, the sacrifice of the ethmoidal arteries is also very important uh, when you use a transcribiform approach for an mm -hmm. olfactory groove meningioma. This can greatly uh, devascularize the tumor. Which is back. I want to see the poster. That's a little better. Bipolar? Yeah, that's one of the early devascularization steps that really takes the majority of the blood supply on. Sort of akin to you know, taking the middle meningeal on a convexity or a, a lateral sphenoid wing. So you can see that we're not going to take this tumor out on block in the traditional sense. Um, the tumor is, is actually restricting your ability to work ar Two around things. it. Um, and it also, it, you won't have as good a visualization of the intracranial dissection. So it's perfectly acceptable to, to debulk the tumor. Scissor. But then we do an on-block excision of the area of skull base invasion. So in that sense, it's still non-block excision. And, we, and you have to be very, the thing that matters is the margins. <clears throat> so we have to be very cognizant and, and obsessive about our margins. A straight scissor. 
<clears throat> Bye, Paul. Make sure I leave enough stump here so I don't cut it in the orbit on. Third of foam. <clears throat> Irrigation. All right, so let me see that Aquamantis one more time. <clears throat> We're just going to fry the tumor a little bit, and then we can, I think, start uh, resecting the skull base. And I don't care about margins here, so I just want hemostasis. Bottle. So you can see the first olfactory fiber here if we pull back the top of the tumor. So that's the beginning of the cribriform plate. To it, Terry. Give me a little more frontal mucosa. All right. So now, as I drill, I may come across those ethmoidals one more time, but I'm going to start on this patient's left side. Let me get a through cut, actually. I'm going to just trim the tumor for visualization. I want to try to avoid trimming it too close to skull base because I'll get CSF coming out of the olfactory fibers. And when there's intracranial extension Type of tumor, we don't want to just pull on that tumor. Uh, this, you know, this should be a very controlled, uh, you know, microscopic excision. Bottle. There you see the olfactory fibers coming through the olfactory. Never mind. Uh, drill through the cribriform plate. I like to start posteriorly where I really know the where the optic is, I can visualize it. Look at them one more time. There's our optic right there. So your posterior limit really is the optic canal. And that doesn't change if you're doing this open or endonasally. The only thing you can get open is if there's tumor going farther than the mid orbit. More lateral than the mid orbit. So my posterior osteotomy runs right at the posterior planum in front of the optics. You know, for a meningioma, if it goes that posteriorly, then I may have to take it farther back, but here I don't think we need to. And I'm not going to take my dural margin quite this far posteriorly, but... Getting tip or you okay with this? There was a question about the role, the role of preoperative embolization. Um, Do it, Terry. And um, the, usually, anesthesias are not something that you need to do that, but also um, the, the issue with embolizing through the uh, ethmoidal is that the shared collateral sometimes, uh, and there are much more dangerous embolization here from the NGOMA. That's one of the challenges of embolizing olfactory glue in the uh, um, Any comments, Paul or Carl? Yeah, I think it's not an option for anterior. When you're worried about ethmoidal supply, the collateral with the collateralization with the uh, ophthalmic is too <coughs> too predictable and too high risk to embolize. So you you would end up having to embolize through the ophthalmic, which is I think a disaster waiting to happen. Definitely a recipe for blindness in a certain number of patients. Now on the right side, we're not concerned about tumor margin in the ethmoid region. Bug. So the roof of the ethmoid sinus is an adequate skull base margin. On the left side, we'll have to go all the way to the medial wall of the, of the orbit. It, there's a there's a question uh, um, again about uh, respecting your foster involves and um, like Ms. Snyder, can you comment a little bit? When would you potentially consider a unilateral approach? What would your what what would be your threshold of actually considering that? So a unilateral skull base resection can only be done for this for the smallest of tumors. So a Kadish A or B may be a candidate okay. as long as the tumor does not cross the midline. However, 
uh, even for a tumor that doesn't cross the midline, it can be very difficult to preserve olfaction on the other side because in the, in the act of getting the exposure and getting adequate margin, you often will lose the olfaction anyway, especially if you're going to give postoperative radiation therapy. So our bias is always to um, err on the side of more, uh, a greater excision of the skull base. Certainly if, there's, if, if the tumor is entirely extracranial, then we would attempt a unilateral excision. Uh, if the tumor is invading the bone or Bipole. extending intracranially, then we always do a bilateral excision Bipole. of the bone, the dura, the olfactory bulbs, and the tracts. On. I've seen several cases over the years where the bone was intact, there was no radiographic evidence of Drill. intracranial tumor, but once we excised the olfactory well. bulb, we saw macroscopic tumor extending along the olfactory filia into the olfact olfactory bulb. Yeah, Frank disease in the olfactory bulb, <clears throat> you see that one or two times, it's enough to convince you. Now, you know, maybe that can be cured with radiation. We don't really know, but we know the most important thing for, for prognosis is a, is a complete resection. Negative margins, huh? <clears throat> really thinned bone here by the tumor, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, really pushing it over. So you can see how the frontal sinus, the posterior table of the frontal sinus, becomes the anterior margin of resection. I have to take that a little more laterally the bone, but <clears throat> we'll see. Same thing on this side. I'm just going to make an osteotomy, but here it needs to be right up to the medial orbit. You'll notice that uh, I'm not using uh, an irrigating device for the scope. Um, we're just using a syringe with a curved olive tip attachment so I can irrigate down the shaft of the scope. I think it gives me more rapid clearing of the, of the visual field and it also helps uh, irrigate the bone and wash away debris in the surgical field. So now we're coming up on the crista galley in, in the midline here between the frontal sinuses and anterior to the cribriform plate. So let's see here if our plate is, our bone plate is maybe not through it enough, are we? No. See, I can retract the periorbital with my suction and drill, and I can take that all the way out to mid-orbit if I wanted to. So I'm just retracting orbital fat, and the optic nerve itself and the muscle cone is fine. Now, if you do violate the periorbita and have herniation of orbital fat, then just shrink the fat with the bipolar. Don't try to resect it or pull it out. Just, just shrink the fat. Uh, Paul, for the audience, can you point one more time the um, optic nerve prominences which show yeah. the, the margin? Sometimes the degree of pneumatization of the sphenoid obviously can make them more prominent than others. Um, but it's, it's extremely important to be able yeah. to identify them. There's the left optic. There's the right optic. And you can see our posterior osteotomy is in line with that. So now I'm not sure about my osteotomies on this right side, but I'm going to take a caudal and peel out the skull base here. I think I need to complete it more, huh? I need to do better on this side. I'm trying to take this right up to Dura, but not through it, obviously, with my drilling. I kind of want to see that the bone's thin enough to move and break, fracture. <laughs> yeah, very, very low hanging cribriform. So you have to reach up to these edges. Dr. Gardner, would you, um, uh, for this approach, the transcriminal approaches, would you modify your exposure uh, to facilitate reconstruction? 
Cotto, uh, modifying the exposure for the reconstruction, you said? Yes. Now, I, I, obviously, I think that's a, you know, Cotto, a, a bad idea. I think, uh, you know, one of my critiques of things like a gasket seal closure is you have to do a certain exposure for that to work. You have to rely on, it's going to be right into your skull base. You have to make sure and try to limit your bony exposure to, in some locations for your reconstruction. I think the reconstruction should follow the defect and not your defect be made too much with consideration of the reconstruction. Coddle? I think the, the steps have to be considered separately or you potentially impact your, your resection uh, quality. Uh, it's a good question though, and I think if you're really considering your reconstruction so much, then need to think about the technique that you're using. Um, and that's not to say that I don't think the gasket seal works. I think obviously buttressing in there is a, is a great idea. It's just the capability, for example, in a case like this, trying to buttress something in here is virtually impossible. The same thing I think goes, this is gonna be left anterior skull base. Yeah. For things like fat, I don't like using intracranial fat, especially in the supracellar space. It absolutely works. If you plug a hole with fat, it will work but it, um, you are potentially replacing uh, the mass effect with more mass effect. And most people I know who've used that technique have at one point or other had to, to take out a portion of the, the fat. I used it recently. We had a 500 pound, that's more of the left, 500 pound, actually 510 pound patient with a craniopharyngioma going up into the third ventricle. Uh, in that patient, I did place a small plug of fat because I felt that his risk of leak was so dramatically high compared to the risk of uh, visual uh, compromise that I thought it was worth that trade-off. He, he did well, fortunately. Do it, Terry. Uh, now, another question is: um, um, This is going to be planum, uh, posterior, uh, rather posterior cribriform. Right. Another question was, uh, do we always need to excise the crystal galley and, you know, the, the almost universal <laughs> gas, but can you comment a little bit on your strategy and how to go ahead, go about and resect that in order for, for it to be, uh, yeah. to avoid uh, having like a large piece of bone that's floating, etc. Great and timely question. So, you know, we do the right and the left anterior skull base, and then I do have to do the crystal galley. And I like to dissect it free first because it can be really very challenging if you fracture it off, it's a free floating piece of bone. So I like to try to dissect it as much as possible from the olfactory fibers. See where the crystal gallery is, a, a cecum, huh? You see that the gardener left intentionally that anterior ledger bone, so it's not, yeah. it's not disconnected. He did not take his uh, osteo image all the way to the front. That was you can intense. see this crystal galley is slightly deformed by the Problem. tumor. It's been pushed to the right side. That's just junk. Yeah, quite a bit. Impressive. There we go. All right. Do it, Terry. Uh, this is all going to be crystal galley. G A L L I. Another question is um, for, let's say, Kadish uh, B tumors that seem to be going right up to um, the dura, but not not uh, clearly violating it. What is your strategy in terms of potentially uh, getting biopsies of the dura and getting a CSF leak um, presser for that? Just to see if there is if there is microscopic violation or not. So you're saying to uh, whether or not to resect the dura in that setting. Right. Would well, you go up to it and then you're not 100% sure? Um, what is your threshold? What is your mentality about actually getting a biopsy of the dura and potentially? Yeah, I, would, I would say we, we dogmatically always resect the dura, at least on one side, because yeah. of those cases where we've seen even located stage tumors invade. Um, and so I think that is an appropriate dogma. It's not always going to be there, but I've absolutely seen cases where. We were a uh, patient came to us after a with a located stage tumor and had it resected as a polyp essentially. And during the follow up surgery, we saw no tumor anywhere except in the olfactory bulb. Right, that's unusual, but those kind of cases, I think, at least form my dogma anyway. 
I well, mean, it's possible to have ectopic tumor elsewhere in the ethmoid region and uh, that does not have contact with the skull there. base. That's the only situation in which I would consider doing an extradural resection. Yeah, there's no contact with the olfactory sulcus. Right. I think an important point is like, no, let's not forget that, you know, the, the origin of the tumors is, um, is traversing the intracranial, intracranial space. So it's almost by definition that there, um, there's tumor traversing the dura in the cribrinal plate. Certainly that's the tissue it likes. We have a Woodson Adson. One of the really important parts of the reconstruction that Dr. Garner is about to do now is actually create that epidural uh, space that will serve um, as a problem. We can tuck our reconstruction or uh, fascia later. Uh, and this is better done at this point. It's Good actually sure. much harder to, to do later once you've resected the dura, but, and he's going to show how we do this. Really important step to remember. We got still a little more work to do on the left. Irrigation. I think our margin on the patient's right is pretty good, Dr. Simon. What do you think? I agree. This left side, I need to extend okay. it a little bit. Yeah, concerned about bony involvement here, potentially. We'll take a kerosene. And also, this will allow us to have a wider <laughs> dural margin on the side of the tumor. There's more of that left skull base. Did you have some already? Yeah? Now, we will generally do 90% of the operation with just the zero degree endoscope. With proper positioning of the patient and extension, uh, we can adequately see from the frontal sinus all the way back. Um, uh, Woodson, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes we'll, we'll use a 45 degree endoscope for the frontal sinus work. So this is that epidural dissection that Dr. Zanonis is talking about. And you can see if I don't do this now, when I have uh, the dura in place, I'll never be able to do it. Yep, I will. I got the whole side more. And the woods is actually naturally a very good instrument to do that. It works really well. This is just a Woodson Adson from our, you know, open surgical tray, open crany tray. We can maybe get by with a smaller drill defect on the left. Yes, agreed. Okay. On patients, right? Yeah. Now I got to be careful back here as I come close to the optics. Not getting too aggressive with this, but this will allow me to tuck this later. All right, let me get that kerosene again. <clears throat> I don't need to go more posterior, do you think? No, lateral posterior. No. No, Send this as left lateral bony margin for permanent. Perhaps they could do that while we place the derm. Now, uh, Dr. Snyderman, uh, can you come in a little bit, you know, for tumors, uh, perhaps not necessarily olfactory group? Um, Tutor? Oh, the seizure neuroblastomas, but. How far lateral would you think it's uh, uh, is achievable to go uh, with uh, medial orbitectomy? How far, uh, what do you think is uh, going laterally? Uh, if you sacrifice the ethmoidal arteries, you can reliably get to the mid plane of the orbit. Oh. Um, so if, if we have a, a, a malignant tumor where we need additional dural margin, we can do that. Or a meningioma with a dural tail. I can dissect but, all the way out there. But for a malignancy, if a malignancy a extends six. beyond that margin and you can't get a good dural margin, then we'd have to combine this approach with a transcranial or a transorbital approach. Is that Woodson one more time? Yeah, that's an excellent point that the, the type of pathology certainly plays, plays into it. But you can see how Dr. Garner can depress. Can you give 25 of mannitol, please? And fight laterally. We have 25 of mannitol, please. 
I do not normally use mannitol in this situation, but we can really see how, given the, the shape of the skull base and, and also the intracranial involvement, and she is, uh, uh, I don't know if she's obese, but she's certainly on the overweight side. Um, we're going to have a little bit of uh, frontal lobe herniation. I want to, you know, proactively treat surgifone. <clears throat> Would you ever consider um, not using a lumbar drain after a uh, surgery procedure, Dr. Garner? Irrigation. Good question. A lumbar drain is something that, you know, there's a lot of question about, but we studied it, I think, as well as you can. We did a randomized controlled trial, which would be level one evidence, big bulb, to look at this. And we found that, and pituitary tumors were not included in this, but supracellar tumors, meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, posterior fossa tumors, chordomas, and tumors like this. And we found that for these large anterior skull base defects, uh, it was significantly lower rates of CSF leak. In fact, we stopped the trial early, it was so significant for these and for posterior fossa. For supracellar, big bulb, it was not. So I think it's the size of the defect, the location of the flap relative to it. These things didn't make as much of a difference. So a lumbar drain here, I think, is should be used. Just doing some warm saline irrigation for hemostasis right now talked about that. Yeah, we did, yeah. All right, so now, to it, right? We're gonna open the dura. I'm actually gonna bipolar start on the side away from the tumor. On. You can see tumor going right through right there. Very obvious. So I think we can see our margin that we want it to take. Not very subtle. Right there, get some more, a little bit of bone off of here. Got some stringless half by halves, please. It's going to be the part of the main tumor specimen here. Take a retractable blade. So I'm just going to come just lateral to where the olfactory tract is. Agree with that? Yep. Now we don't have to be as aggressive on this side because the tumor blade. did not cross the midline. Feather blade. <clears throat> just want to be enough to make sure I get my olfactory fibers and, and tract out. Why not through all the way? Maybe not. Thank you. 45 Gardner. I'll need a straight one eventually. And can you put the up toes on the bipole now? Actually, you know what? Not just yet. Ah, we get a half a half no string. You see that bit of herniation here. The frontal lobes is going to torture us a bit. Try to get a patty intradurally to retract on. The stringless patties are a nightmare for, for scrubs, but they are you very useful. Forty-five Gardner. Yes, they're nice to protect the brain. They're not so nice to keep track of, but necessary evil, I think. Feather blade. I want to get just in front of that first olfactory fiber. 45 Gardner. Yeah, there's going to be a vein that crosses approximately there. Switch to the straight tip on the bipolar if you can. You need a little more bone, huh? Yep. I need a little more bone off here. Another half by half uh, bipolar. On. There's that vein. And this vein is believed to be one of the reasons that frontal sinusitis can cause a brain abscess without a defect in the frontal. Off. Huh? 
And this, um, it, it's, it's worth mentioning, this anterior uh -huh. extent, uh, that may be one area that we don't really, while not compromising our extent of uh, like the boring opening, it's important not to not to go well beyond what what um, what you need as well, uh, because that that is one of the most common areas of a leak uh, afterwards if the leak happens. So, getting just just yes. as you as you need, I think it's important. What do you think, Paul? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things if you do end up using a pericranial flap is the pericranial flap is very complementary to a nasal septal flap in that it covers this anterior margin beautifully, whereas the nasal septal flap covers the posterior margin well. Here, we're not planning on using a, a pericranial flap, um, so we really have to make sure that we tuck our fascia in this area uh, meticulously. So we are prepared for a pericranial flap if, if uh, we felt we needed one. We already uh, pinned the patient in a way that we have access to, to the scalp for a bicoronal scalp incision. And we shaved a little bit of the hair Irrigation. just along Irrigation. the incision line, so we would be prepared for it if needed. Sure. I have a very low threshold for using a pericranial flap if I'm concerned about tumor involvement of the nasal septum. So, for example, a, uh, a, a higher grade tumor, would you skip a, a nasal septal flap in a higher grade tumor? Yeah, so if we had a squamous cell carcinoma invading the nasal septum, I probably would be more likely to go straight to a Bipolar. pericranial flap. On. I really extended her more even, huh? Yeah. 45 Gardner. Feel better about that. Taking this right up to an, uh, another stringless body. There was a question about um, what kind of dural, what kind of margins rather are obtained in such a procedure. Um, and we spoke a little bit during the introduction that, um, you know, obviously we, we get margins in the anterior and laterally, but it's, it's as important to get, it's not important to get margins on the faults as well as the olfactory uh, tracks. Um, it's something that um, we'll demo or would nicely demonstrate it later. Any other comments, Paul yeah. uh, Carl, about margins and the strategy of obtaining them? Oh, all right. Comments about oh, margins? Oh, about the uh, yeah, you know where where we need to make sure and take them. Yeah, I mean, um, you, know, you can see we're doing an on block excision of the area of tumor invasion. So we, we want to take uh, dura certainly circumferential to the uh, cribriform plates to the olfactory mucosa. Um, on the left side, um, you know, we take a half centimeter beyond the the area visible area of the tumor. But most importantly, Bible. after we re remove the my primary specimen, uh -huh. we're going to take additional dural margins circumferentially and get frozen sections to make sure that we have a complete removal. Now, some people will take that from the primary specimen, and I think that's fine too. We prefer this. I think it's a, a like for the tumor to be out and then be checking margins. Um, Another question is whether it's worth uh, placing a lumbar drain ahead of time just to facilitate um, some drainage. We had this case here. It was actually unusual that you had to give some mannitol. Uh, many that's times, actually, the the, the CSF pulsations and some fullness actually help deliver the tumor to some extent. Well, what do you think, um, Dr. Garner? I agree, agree 100%. It's unusual that it would be an issue and uh, cer certainly a reasonable thing to do, though. Good afternoon, guys. It's Eric. Sorry, good. it took me a little while hey. to get back on. Right. But, um, you know, I would also Recover say about the margin. Recovered. Oh, I think everything's, yeah, she's doing well. She was uh, almost awake by the time I was there leaving. But um, the uh, one thing about margins from the sinonasal portion is that you are really responsible for them. You know, I mean, you can make the pathology report kind of look how you want it to, but you really want to take true margins. And so you really have right, to understand the three-dimensionality of your tumor. You really take full responsibility of it. So you, you got to think about all those areas. And so we are pretty dependent on frozen to 45. help us with that. Um, and I think that, you know, as you take those on, you, you definitely want to be creating a three-dimensional map in your mind um, of, how, of where those margins are. And um, I often actually will, at the end of the case, 
take a picture or something of the um, of the report that comes from our nurses so that I can go back in my mind and have those down. So in a week when I get the actual margin report, I don't have to sort of depend solely on my memory uh, to to recall exactly which margins I'm thinking about or if there's an area that's closer of concern. Those are just a few tips. It's, it, yeah, it, I mean, I was, on, I was, on, a, on a case with like this, we Michael. may we'll probably have 30 to 40 specimens. So we're really mapping every uh, area of the sinuses and the skull base so that uh, when we get the path report, we know exactly where margins are close or if there's a positive margin where that's located. Irrigation. Yeah, and then uh, another important point is to uh, make sure that the coagulated margins are actually not, uh, I'm sorry, that the margins are actually not coagulated. Um, it's, it's, it's sometimes a little bit uh, counterintuitive uh, when you have something bleeding uh, and keep biting on it. Uh, straight gardener? True margins string with half usually obtained without, before we actually coagulate the dura if it's bleeding. Uh, Paul, can you comment a little bit about your, um, uh, Stratton, Stratton. what you're doing now uh, to potentially avoid injury to any ACA branches, the orbital frontal branches will be mostly, um, uh, I'm sorry, the frontal polar and orbital frontal branches will be mostly at risk here. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit about how you go around doing that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, stringless, so placing the patties to displace the brain away. Um, you know, I'm working from the outside in. Uh, using, you know, I use this, uh, little micro through cut that storage makes so I avoid a sharp scissor. Um, so I think it, they won't grab the uh, less likely to hook uh, a vessel. It's more like a blunt dissector over top of it. And, and dynamic endoscopy. Right, right, so right. So there's right. constant adjustment to give the best view possible. If you just have the scope parked back here, you're not yeah. going to have the same visualization. Yeah, and a contraindication, we think, to static endoscopy. All right, so now I can deal with it. Can we get the uh, up toe bipolar? So now you can see the only place I have left to release the dura is back at the planum and then here at the uh, falx. Now, the falx is tricky because it obviously goes interhemispheric and also it goes all the way up the posterior table of the frontal, uh, up the posterior aspect of the frontal bone. So. I want to make sure that my distal frontal orbitals and veins are dissected away here. You see the tumor invading. There's the fog, so I have a grossly negative margin here. And then bipolar. Yeah, on. Straight gardener. Carl, Paul, did you guys get a very good epidural tuck on this one? Yeah, great, we talked, great point. We did. We, we remembered to do it, actually. It looks really good. But that's one thing as you resect more of the frontal or the posterior okay. table sometimes you you tend to forget or not you can right. forget it but it's actually such a nice component um, for the reconstruction great so you can see if i keep going anteriorly that fox will go forever so i have to start going posteriorly here to get to where it ends right there bipolar Remember, anteriorly it continues all the way up to the superior sagittal sinus. On. Great gardener. Switch to the fine tips again. <clears throat> I'm just skiving where I think is a grossly negative margin. Going posteriorly, and there I've released the falx. So now the falx released. So I'll take a left scissor. And now. Again, that same Kersey scissor I can use to dissect the. There you can see the tumor. Now the tumor is not technically, I guess that's brain invasion, but it's actually the olfactory tract it's invading. And there, you know, there weren't any T2 weighted changes on MR. Stringless. So, so we don't think there's subpeel invasion. Stringless. Let's compare our two olfactory tracts here. The big fat full one, and here's the normal one on this side. Look, there's a little bit of tumor on this other side. Look at that. Tumor mm. in the contralateral factory tract. So, scissor left. Definitely needed to resect both here. So, I think we can take that there, don't you think? 
Dr. Schneiderman? Yes, I do. Get a bipolar here, maybe, for that vessel. Get on the 25 on the bipolar, please. On bipolar. On. on. Scissor. See a uh, pretty impressive involvement on that side, huh? Yep. And I think that was su suggested by the imaging. Yeah. And we'll take this as a margin, obviously. Stringless fatty for this side. There's our frontal orbital. Actually, I'm sorry, frontal polar over there, or medial. Scissor left. Bipole. Yeah, good idea. Can we uh, inject more icy green on? The irrigation here, Carl. And tell us before you do, please. No, tell us. Don't do it yet, please. Hold on. The side winders on there, please. Irrigation. You did not inject yet, correct? Sorry? No. Okay. Okay. Gonna get a little bit of bleeding under control here and then we'll inject. On. Scissor last. Irrigation. All right. All right. Go ahead and hit inject there. Bipolar. Should be able to see that ACA light up back here. See the frontal polars and then the veins light up very nicely. Still a little blood supply in the tumor. Look at that. The tumor is lighting up. Still got still alive. Did you guys use the intensity on? gradient at no. all? Can we go to put the intensity gradient on? Can you give me some irrigation here, Carl? It's just not working well. Yeah. 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 Anytime. Anytime. Turn it to 35. So we're going to use an intensity map that will, the intensity or the color tells you how much vascularity, vascularity larity there is. It shows it in relative strengths. And you notice the um, color bar on the, on the side there. Very cool. All right, scissor left. So still the tumor's a bit alive. I can't say we looked at that before. Half by half stringless. Bipole first. On, scissor left. Starting to see some normal factory track posteriorly. Half by half, no string. A lot more normal. See that frontal polar again on that side? All right. That's perfect. Scissor left. So I think we're happy with our gross margin there, Dr. Simon. You agree? Yes. It's going to be dural margin. Sorry, dural, sorry, dural, main dural specimen. Sorry. 
This will be the, this will be main dural specimen. Pituitary. Pituitary. Now, if you want, uh, as you take this out, you can orient it and and put sutures on it for the pathologist. But we'll just have them check the margins on permanent. So you can really see how that left side and right side are very different. This is going to be, let me get a stitch. I'm going to take a stitch on left anterior. Here's, just our, here's our specimen. Just do this as this is fine. Main dural specimen is fine. Irrigation. These mediums. Yes. Irrigation. So now we want to do our dural and olfactory track margins. Then after that, we'll harvest fascia as we wait for all of our margins. Now, what margins did you send in the sinus, Dr. Schneiderman? Bipolar? Um, so I got fr fr frozen sections on the nasal septal mucosa on both sides to make sure that I resected on. enough of the left side and also that on. there wasn't tumor involvement of the flap. Off. Irrigation. So as Dr. Zanos mentioned, I'm sort of letting a little bit of ooze happen from the olfactory tracks. I don't want the pathologist to have any excuses. All right, scissor left. We get that six suction now. <clears throat> Bipole. Yeah, we don't want to lose the specimen up the suction. This happened, unfortunately. Switch back to the fine tips on this. On. Scissor left. It's going to be left olfactory track for frozen. Pituitary, please. <clears throat> Bye, Paul. On by pull. Off. On. Off. Uh, Fortune me a little bit there. Irrigation. A little twisted there, maybe. Bipole. On. Off. Scissor left. <clears throat> Next is going to be right olfactory tract margin. I left it behind, yeah. Pituitary. Do I take a little more? Or? Mm -hmm. hurt. Yeah, Bipole. So. That's part one for frozen. Bipole. This is going to be part two for permanent. Oh, right olfactory track on. Yeah. Is there left? <clears throat> yes. This is left. To a terror. Okay, there we go. Yep, I'll take up to a terror again. 
I'll take a scissor left. It's going to be posterior dural margin for frozen. Yeah, it does. Maybe send a different one. Yeah. Here's part part one for frozen. Let's see. Pituitary. Is the question how hot is the irrigation, uh, the warm irrigation that we use? Forty degrees Celsius. Yeah, you can go as high as forty-five. Is there less? So you, we usually um, play it on the safe side because we're operating on the brain. And keep it at 40 degrees. Another question: Why why you not start from the posterior pole uh, of the tumor? I think it's a little bit harder to actually. Um, yeah, it's the direction of dissection from anterior to posterior is much easier. To it, sir. Plus, gravity is helping you. If the right. specimen falls down. This is going to be part two. For permanent posterior drill margin. To it, sir. Is there left? I'll give you a little more of that. So we're a little concerned. This dura looks a little thick here. So I, we're think taking just, I think it's okay, but so we're taking additional margins just to be sure. Forty-five gardener. Carl, Paul, would you like to comment if, let's say the tumor has even more lateral extension, what are maneuvers you could use to get that lateral scissor. margin? So we can obviously work over the orbit, retract the orbit and remove all this bone and then chase the dura out in that direction. That's one thing that can be done. Uh, we could, if we thought we need to do a pericranial flap, we can do a small Frontal sinus resection that gives us essentially a small craniotomy, 45 Gardner, and work through that to chase over the orbit, or even even do an orbit, uh, like a or eyebrow approach, eyebrow craniotomy. We have done all of the all of the above at one time or another. This is going to be right lateral dural margin for frozen. Give you more. More. Scissor left. Start from the top down. Finish it. See, the uh, <clears throat> brain's a lot less full after that little bit of mannitol. That'll help with the recon as well. Do it, Terry. Ah, you get a four suction on the other one, please. Do it, Terry. Be our right lateral dural margin, some more of it for frozen. Scissor left. Two it, Terry. Those are left. Get one more. I'm trying to hold off on irrigation because yes. it makes me so I have to suction a little more. Well. So 
other side, we peel this little strip of lateral dural margin here, pituitary. Quickly. You see, Carl? Let me see if I got it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right lateral dural margin. Got it? Turn the light on, maybe. Sure. Scissor left. Sweet. At least, yeah. Scissor left. Just, just the one. Just the one, please. Two, Terry. There you go. Yep. Yeah. All right. 45 Gardner. I think we need to. Yeah. Harrison one. Going to be the left lateral dural margin. So here we're just using a size one kerosene to resect this dura. Has to do with the angle more than anything. 45 scissor. There's some in there. 45 scissor. Yep. Hog here. I'm sure everybody knows that. Too. Right. Dr. Algadas here. Dr. Algadas, you want to? Uh, do our fascia lata harvest. Show everyone how we do that. Our neurosurgery fellow is extraordinaire. You see if Dr. Patel is here as well, BJ Patel. Alex. Do it, Terry. This is the, the margin we're really most concerned about. It's going to be our left lateral dural margin for frozen. Fortunately, did a better job with that one. <clears throat> there you go. Yep. And 45 Gardner again. This is going to be our left anterior dural margin. Also for frozen. Uh huh. Give you more of that though. Ah, uh, really far interior here, huh? Mm -hmm. My fault. We should have extended more, huh? Garrison. I'm partially clogged there, maybe. I don't know. Two, two. Don't want to have to fight this. Want it to be clean? Let's just jump. I take that mucosa. Uh, yeah, I guess for yeah. Two or This is the fascia lot is on contact. Right, right. So we're going to strip some of this frontal sinus mucosa, not for oncologic reasons, but for reconstruction. Our fascia lot is going to overlap this uh, bone. We want it to be in contact with bone, not mucosa. What is this frontal sinus mucosa? Frontal sinus? Yeah. Can go with the other one. Yeah. 45 scissor. BJ, why don't you, why don't you scrub? Help Dr. Algadis. All right. Neurosurgery and ENT fellows extraordinaire. 
will uh, also demonstrate the fasciolata for us. Do it, Terry. That's going to be left anterior dural margin. Kerrison, uh, one. Yeah. And then a bipole. On. And finally, a 45 gardener or our right anterior dural margin. Plugged again. Scissor left, scissor left. Forty five gardener, tough angle. Bipole, can we get the sidewinders on the bipole? This a four. This a four. We got one more margin to take after this. Our folks, of course. Bipole. Bipole. On. Forty five gardener. Forty five gardener. Oh. Barely reached that. Two it, Terry. All right, there's our anterior dural margin. Right. Right, right. anterior dural right. margin. Now we got to take our fault, straight gardener. <clears throat> uh, they can, they can show it. it's fine. 45 gardener, can't reach it. There we go. And then this is going to be our anterior. Ooh, it's got stuff on, huh? Clean. This is going to be our Falks margin. Anything else, Dr. Schneiderman? Nope, that covers it. All right, irrigation. Make sure things are dry. Get these stringless patties out, and we'll what our margins look like. So we do the fasciolata while we wait for our margins. Bipole, pull, please. On by pull. Okay. One of them drives while the other one harvests. Huh? Irrigation. I guess we could put the Dura matrix in all yeah, the way. Yeah, I think we should. Can we get a three by three Dura matrix? And then we should just jump in and keep things moving. That, yeah. yeah. Two it there. Two it there. You can go and send your frozens. Put them hmm? Put them on that. Yes. So send that. Uh, we can soak that Dura matrix. Thank you. Irrigation. Oh, 
try measuring this. Just going to use the whole thing. But I guess that's not a bad idea. I mean, just to show them how big it is. Get a uh, two or A bipole first. On. Uh, Carl, there's a question from the audience whether um, do you specifically request for HPV 6 or 11 to be tested for in the specimens? By uh, irrigation, HPV. Oh, not, not for all factor neuroblastoma. For squamous cell carcinoma, we would. A sandwich, please. A little vein bleeding right on top of the frontal polar here, so I'm just going to put a, some avatine sandwich on here so that we don't. Um, risk coagulating the artery as well. And you may say that, uh, okay, uh, regular is what I wanted. Yeah. You may say that, well, so what? You lose that little vessel, but I think if it's, if it's my frontal lobe, I'll probably try to keep it. Hold off a little Ah. This should do the job plenty well for. Now we can measure this defect. If we want to taking a half by half inch patty. You can see that it's probably one half, one, a little over one and a half by one, a little over one and a half by one inches. So we're going to want like a three by three inch fascial graft, so big fascial graft, irrigation, because we want to tuck in the epidural space. Ah, sandwich. <clears throat> Is that Dura Matrix soaking? Is that Dura Matrix soaking? Let them, yeah, let them in, please. Sean, why don't you guys go ahead and start? It's okay because they're um, they're on that side. It's fine. It's your fault. Keep working here. You can see that they can. You got, got a headlight. We can turn lights on. Put the lights on if we want. Just give them some stuff to work with and let them take care of themselves. That's better. So for the Dura matrix, the inlay graft, I'm going to cut a slit in the Falx. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Sean, Sean, hold on. Maybe you left glove, please. I'll take the Dura matrix and a heavy scissor. Another question is whether uh, there is a specific Move the stuff out of your way. Move the stuff out of your way. Don't don't make a mess. So, Dr. Time, you want to show the. So, I'm just put a little slit here in the Dura matrix for the folks. This may be a little big, but to Terry, but we'll see. The graft, in other words. See, though. Just grab it in the middle. I'm going to insert this, maybe. Okay. Hemostat, please. We put this in. Uh, it'll be good. Hemostat. Hemostat. Dr. Simon is just going to replace the spyway. Don't put that on the other side of your arm there, Carl.
Three on the bow pull. On. Off. What do you guys need? Did we send off frozen? Okay, just making sure. All right. Mm -hmm. This inlay is intended to be entirely intradural. Take a 45 ethmoid, please. Thank you. If you can just set up a plate and a ball probe, I can just handle those myself while you guys do the. But I really like a wide tuck as an inlay. I feel like the more tissue I have there, the more not only kills dead space, but also helps ensure that <clears throat> I have contact everywhere. Again, we talked about this maybe a little bit of a large graph, but I'm going to push it forward, aren't I? Even more. Or, or the downsides of having. So if this were too large, um, I guess if it's causing pressure outside the the area, and, you know, um, coming out of the defect, I think that's not really a major concern here. Well, bridging epidural veins. Yeah, I guess I could I could damage a vein laterally. I don't think uh, we didn't see any. Certainly, uh, something to consider. And this arguably is perhaps the most important part of the case, one of them for sure. Now this is not a watertight material, right? So you would not want to use this as your only reconstructive material. This would not be adequate. We think the multi-layer reconstruction is really key. Posteriorly, I have to be careful about my optics. That would be a downside, I guess, of too much graft here. The idea here is to get as much contact between our grafts and native tissue as possible. Which I think we're achieving here. Yeah, an option. Sure, I didn't get too folded here. Let's see if we can find our slit again. A slit. Okay, there's our slit. Good. A little bit twisted, perhaps, our graft is here, huh? There we go. Better. So this time, this part of the case, try to make sure I spend as much time as possible on knowing it's the greatest source of complication. I'm pretty happy with that. A little bit of fold on the one side, but that's okay. Get a um, giraffe, please. Let me try coming from this side. Mm -hmm. You just switch nostrils so I can reach across. Never mind, I got it with that maneuver. Okay, excellent. So now, if we want to, you want to show the fascia. So they've cut through, you know, this incision in the thigh. This is uh, about halfway down the thigh, not too high up, because we don't want to get into the uh, uh, into the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. 
not too low because then we start to run into the iliotibial band. Iliotibial band is uh, uh, part of the knee stabilization. It's one of the only things you have to worry about here. <clears throat> Between the lateral femur cutaneous and the iliotibial band, though, you can take pretty much the entire fascia lata. In fact, more is uh, probably better if we're looking at uh, any issues with entrapment of muscle. The only way you get entrapment is you have a very small opening and a very big swollen muscle. They're dissecting now laterally out towards the iliotibial band. We would actually normally do the right side, although it doesn't really matter. Uh, we chose the left side because of uh, a tattoo in this case. Dr. Simon, let me put a couple half by threes over our Dura matrix just so we don't have. Uh... Okay. Thing we don't want is all this blood running in on our reconstruction. Certainly, it looks like a nice dry field, but I'm going to cover this just to be safe. One more. Um, just to say one more time, we've been getting many, um, uh, many uh, questions about specific products and, um, you know, whether there's a bipolars or uh, the only uh, uh, dual substitute, etc. Um, because of university policies, again, we, we're not allowed to share company names. Um, uh, but certainly um, after afterwards, uh, if you are able to email us uh, or Mary Jo will be more than happy to uh, provide all the information. Um, it's just a logistical thing of uh, the university policy. Sure. Yeah, we can send around a list of equipment, certainly, and uh, you know, happy to have other discussions about that. Definitely an important piece, uh, an important piece of this. You see, Dr. Patel and Dr. Algadis not only can do excellent skull-based surgery together, but they can even harvest an excellent fascial graft together. Teamwork every step of the way. VJ, what's your what's your plan next year, VJ? All right. Dr. Patel has uh, not had enough training, so he wants to go on to a pediatric fellowship after this, and then uh, you'll be looking for a job, I assume. I can tell you, I, I can tell you, we would hire him if we had a spot. So, going to be looking for a uh, pediatric ENT who can really do skull base. He's your man. And then Dr. Algada says, "What uh, one and a half more years, and he'll be free man to the world as well." on the neurosurgery side. Till then, we still have their indentured servitude. So they're, they're working hard here because, you know, it's easy to get a long graft. Just make a longer incision, but getting a wide graft, so going medially and laterally, is actually much more difficult and, and takes a lot of effort working, you know, with the uh, the retractors uh, in concert with each other to get the widest graft possible. We're just asking. I think our what was our total blood loss on that? Okay, so we're about, about 800 cc's total of blood loss on this. I think you get, you know, sort of a generalized ooze throughout the case that builds up. You know, one thing we don't take into account of, obviously, is we let off some CSF, probably 100 cc's or so, but I don't think it matters in the big scheme of things if uh, we're off by that amount. 
it's uh, keeping track of blood loss in these is a uh, uh, takes a lot of concerted effort. The uh, scrub nurse or scrub tech has to track all of the irrigation. She has you know hash marks showing herself how much every time we use a, an irrigation. But if you don't do that, you know you don't have any way to track because the irrigation and blood all mix in your canisters. You certainly can track hemoglobins, but uh, you know, we we ask a lot of our scrub techs on these cases, and they uh, they come through. Excellent job, Kitty. Today, a very a lot going on. They have to track all of our specimens. In addition to keeping us uh, happy with the instruments we're getting. Both of those are difficult tasks. Yeah, Paul, you want to talk about why we use fasciolata? Yeah, so we've we've uh, did not initially use fasciolata. This was a, uh, you know, we always worry about the morbidity of any added thing. Uh, we didn't have a tremendous amount of experience. We used a lot of different autographs. We really thought the autographs might be the secret. Uh, and you know, Dr. Wong was a big proponent of uh, using. I'm sorry, we used a lot of different allografts. So we had a lot of different materials. We kept trying some that we were very happy with. Uh, and uh, But Dr. Wong was a big proponent, uh, and we used it on a couple of cases, you know, post-radiation, multi-time redos without good reconstructive options. And seeing how it functioned in those situations, when even when everything else failed, sometimes the fascia would work, was something that really convinced, uh, convinced us of how important it is you know, this patient's tissue that was freshly vascularized, uh, how well it heals. It can heal so much better than a, uh, an, an allograft. So I do think there's a big advantage. There are still occasions if we just need some minor coverage um, and we worry about the morbidity of it that we won't take it. But And, and patients certainly get surgical site pain from the fascia allograft. It's not um, it's not without consequence, but it's never uh, long term. It never has any long term consequences to it yet that I've ever seen. We have patients who are triathletes. They, they may have some muscle bulge temporarily, but as it heals and scars down, that goes away. Um, and I haven't had anybody yet knock on wood with any chronic pain from it. I think we're very careful about our harvest site, which helps. Uh, but I think the donor site morbidity or, or relative lack thereof is, is worth it. You can see how hard they're working. You know, this is only about a seven centimeter incision. So they're really stretching it in all directions to be able to get a, a larger. The fascial graft is much longer and wider than the incision is itself. But while we don't do endoscopic, which you certainly could, uh, we think this is a more efficient way to do it uh, than doing it endoscopically. Um, we are we do extend the reach of, of what we're able to uh, harvest. Pretty shortly, we'll have a nice fascial graft here. Now we're going to go ahead and start doing our reconstruction. I'm going to be careful not to cut the fascia to fit too perfectly, because obviously, if we do that and then our margin's positive somewhere, now we've got a problem. You know, my inlay graft I think is fine regardless of whatever margin I might take uh, additional. But you want to keep that in mind. You don't want your recon to be too perfect. Um, we may finish this reconstruction before the frozen sections are back, uh, but not by too much. Uh, and we think by doing it in this order, you know, doing the fascia lata while we're waiting for our dural grafts really is the most efficient way to do it with as little downtime as possible for the patient. If we do a pericranial flap, uh, which we did not have to do in this case, we do an extra cranial pericranial flap that we just tunnel in through a small osteotomy in the frontal sinus. In that situation where we've done an open scalp incision, we'll use temporalis fascia. Temporalis fascia is a beautiful uh, uh, material. It's actually, I would say, the closest uh, to Dura uh, possible. Uh, one of our good uh, friends, a, a surgeon, a uh, Croatian surgeon in Zagreb, uh, ENT surgeon actually uh, did a, a really nice study comparing the Dura uh, to temporalis fascia and found that uh, dura and temporalis fascia are almost identical with respect to their elasticity, their uh, durability, their thickness. And if you ever, 
if you ever uh, take temporalis fascia and, and do anything with it, you, you realize that very quickly how similar it is. And so I, I really like it as a material. And so uh, you should always remember that. We would use that as our initial layer, the temporalis, the, the uh, deep layer of temporalis right on the muscle. You obviously have to be careful anteriorly where it splits around the fat pad. But use that and then the pericranial flap. Since we're not making the scalp incision here, we're going to preserve that and, and use, use instead uh, fascia lata here. Yeah, it's good. It's on. Just about done here, last portions. You, the, the feeders into the muscle always come off the deep side, so that's when we're going to run into a little bit of this, inevitably. And uh, this definitely can create a seroma in this in, uh, this area. You know, it's a, a muscle belly that's exposed. There's You can see the dead space that we're going to create. Sometimes we'll get some fat graft here, and then you definitely have a, a recipe for a seroma. But in, in general, not, not much of a problem. So we always use a, always leave a drain here. You know, seven JP is what we'll use. They're being very, they're being very careful not to leave material. There's a, a lot there on the superficial layer. There's a loose alveolar tissue. Sorry, loose alveolar. areolar tissue. Yeah, the easiest time to take that off is when you're even before actually. Um, yeah, it's when it's still attached, yeah. Take a four by four once they get that out. Can we get a handle, please? Uh, Dr. Gardner, um, I know we, we went back and forth many times. So what's your preference of actually placing the attached autograph? Do you place it with the uh, attach that was originally facing the muscle? the other way around yeah I can't I can't say that I have a uh, um, good reason other than that it le that you could never get all of the That's loose fine. areolar tissue off and so I tend to place that side down because then it doesn't get caught in my suction as I'm trying to place it it is kind of nice to have that little bit of loose tissue I think on the intracranial part perhaps it causes a little bit of uh, in inflammation which is not bad from a healing standpoint so I tend to place the, the side that is up toward us now, towards the, the brain. So I don't have to deal with any of that tissue. It just tends to get caught in your suction and grab hold. It's not, not a huge deal, but so I don't think it matters from a healing perspective though. Yeah, it does. This is the side that is um, a little bit more robustly adherent as well to like fat and the rest of the tissue. So somebody may argue it's the one that you know, it's more, uh, it, it wants to adhere more uh, just by its nature. I don't know if that's true or not, just something uh, additional to talk about. All right, Let's see this now? So now, carefully with two hands, I'll hold this and I'll, you can see this this side has still some tissue despite them you know being very careful with it and we do as as usual have a little bit of a longer than wide graft but just by carefully wiping off some of that fat and and you can see this layer doesn't have much at all on it that's the layer that was up and the layer where the muscle was it's going to have a little more so i tend to put that down if you if you have a little hole you can just put some small sutures right to close the holes And maybe scrape this with a 15 blade, but I think I can also just put this. Let me see a 15 blade. 15 blade, please. Let me see a pair of mats. I just want to trim one end here. Why don't you guys go and just put a sponge in there if it's dry, and we'll close that once we get this put in. I want to have a relatively square. Now I'm going to put this. 
different than you might think to a theory. I'm actually going to layer this from side to side. You have your is for this. Put a little more in there, please. You're going to put it side to side and not vertically, and that's because it can tuck most widely. From side to side. So again, I'm going to show this. I sort of grab it with my pituitary on the side that I want facing me, fold it over the pituitary, slide it in, and then essentially unfold it off of it. Now I can tell which is going to be the longer end by the striations because they run in line with the muscle, which is always going to end up being longer in a longitudinal incision. Oh, turning it the wrong way, aren't I? Yeah, it looks like a leaf. Huh? A weave with that fibers going both directions. Yeah, it seems like it doesn't it. I think we just have it twisted a little bit. Maybe so though, huh? Yeah. These fibers are a little bit there we go. Oh, that's right. That's right. All right, so nice job, Dr. Zalgadas and Patel. Very nice job. 45 ethmoid. Twisted, isn't it? Not happy with myself with how I'm placing it, but the, the graft is nice. Huh. Why is that not straight in there? It's just not, is it? Wrong here. What's that? This corner is there. Right? So uh, you just got to stretch it out in there, see what's what. Uh, we'll twist it, it can just twist it. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to tell, isn't it? I think it needs to rotate a little. Mm -hmm. Somehow it's not straight in here. Figure it out. It seems like the weave is uh, misleading, doesn't it? You can have it turned the wrong way, huh? Although this isn't bad, is it? Don't mind this, like this. This is going to work. So here I want to try to tuck it into that epidural space and also onto the frontal sinus. Again, I'll take that. Woodson now. It's very possible our, our nasal septal flap may not reach the frontal sinus, so you want to have good overlap with the bone of the posterior table. Yeah, very likely indeed. So I'm going to tuck this first over top of the orbit, one place that holds it, and then I'm going to tuck it into the peri, the epidural space, that space that we defined before. And the same thing on the other side. Switching sides with the scope. Some of this is a little bit of feel. I have to tuck it and then come back. Into the epidural space then, 45 ethylene. And the idea here is to get as much contact and as much area that will hold on to this graft. So the graft is tucked, so it holds on. Don't want to fold up there, that's for sure. Don't mind a fold over here, but I don't want one anteriorly. Do it, Terry? 
plate dissector. Adjust your focus, maybe. Half by half. You get an eight suction, please. Half by half. Plate dissector. Some of that. Uh, only if you want to take the whole thing out and redo it. So, you think it's bad to place it over the very orbita? Uh, no. 45 ethmoid. See if I can tuck a little more of this over the orbit here. with that. Do a sinus scissor or straight one because it might actually be sharp. Yeah. Generally ill-advised to try to cut a loose graft after you've placed it, but I do think there's a little too much tissue here. There we go. Make sure it's cut all the way before you pull on it. Right. Two or three. Painful, huh? All right. Plate dissector. So now I'm doing the epidural tuck here. And this is largely by feel. I can tell I'm in the epidural space. Once again, we don't want too much material towards the optic. Right. Really happy with that. 45 ethmoid. You rely on this layer so much that uh, makes me feel good knowing it's coming. It's fascia lot of here. Can you look up there with a 45? Are you okay with that? Okay. Plate dissector, one more. Do you have more IC green? Yes, right, about five minutes, we'll do it. 45 F boy. You want to comment, Dr. Snyman, on uh, the frontal sinuses and their patency after this? Yes, yeah, so there is some risk of obstructing the residual frontal sinus. By doing a draft three frontal sinusotomy, 
there should be a drainage pathway, so you don't have to worry about a post-operative mucus seal. Um, we'd rather have a good reconstruction and avoid a CSF leak than worry too much about a mucus seal. Um, the majority of patients who, who do develop a mucus seal postoperatively remain asymptomatic and don't require treatment for it. Just a very small percentage who may develop an expanding mucus seal, and you could come back, you know, four to six months later if necessary, and create a drainage pathway through the through the reconstruction. Obviously, very important to counsel patients about that risk long term. So if they start getting bad headaches or swelling, they know to get that treated. And we have follow-up scans, of course, we can follow that. Pituitary. Pituitary. So now we're going to bring up our nasal septal flap. May not be completely released. You get another eight suction, please. So again, I want to clean off the pericondial side. That's the side that's going to lay against the set it down, against the reconstruction. So I don't want any blood in between the layers. Just like we wouldn't want tissue glue between the layers. So we would not place tissue glue at this point because that would then interpose between two layers we're trying to get to heal. So we're, we're relying on, partly relying on this flap to vascularize the fascia lata. Otherwise, the fascia lata is going to vascularize from the edges. And so even if this flap doesn't cover the entire defect, it will promote Excuse faster her. healing, faster vascularization of the fascia lata. Absolutely. Dramatically faster. So and again, I, I don't bring it straight up for the sphenoid because we would actually lose length from that. I'm going to need a needle tip. Yeah. Take it all the way to station tube there. See how much length we would lose bringing it up that way? So let me just release the pedicle here. So he's going to bring this incision over this to, the, on? to the top of, of the station tube. So we're below the vascular pedicle. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Bottle. Do it here. And so you can either bring the flap up the side. That was a little bony down here. here. Lost room, yep. Yeah. Or you can fill up the sphenoid sinus. Pituitary. If you put a fat graft in the sphenoid sinus, that would fill up the defect and create a more planar or flat surface for bringing up the flap. If you just stretch it across it, the flap will be in the air and it will retract. That's pituitary. Just clean that one. Though. It's got stuff in it. So instead of placing in the sphenoid or putting fat in the sphenoid, I usually try to bring it up the lateral nasal wall like this. And the superior to inferior dimension of the flap becomes the anterior posterior coverage. Yes. And I'm sort of bringing it up diagonally in this case just to get the maximal coverage. But notice how much better that is. But it actually reaches the edges, but that's not going to be enough to heal. But see how, this, how nicely this reaches actually all of the edges of our reconstruction? It's actually up against the bone. So we used to use this by itself and it would work, but it had a higher risk of failing on one of these edges when it would not quite take to the edge. So I think it's the size mismatch that was an issue. That's really nice, Carl. How'd you, that's an amazing plot for this, wow. The patient with an anesthesia and a deviated septum, that's absolutely fantastic. We don't talk about, you know, this is, this is uh, one of the biggest things that we see is people make small, narrow flaps. They don't come close enough to the skull base. I mean, where, where are areas, Carl, that, that usually you see people making uh, mistakes with the flap? Yeah, I mean, they usually make them too short. They're going to inject the icy green. And they don't capture the mucosa of the anterior superior septum. Please, yep, yep. Okay, so we want to watch this pedicle and see if there's still good inflow. The distal part may not light up. And that, that's okay, it takes time. Now, if we don't see this light up, we would do an early MRI to see if that persists and if this is a dead flap. I think just, uh, well, let's leave intensity so for now. Have, that's, so wow, good, that's good beautiful. Inflow. Look at that, fantastic. And look how bright that is. I'd say that's better than some of the surrounding mucosa. And look how distally we're getting already. Wow, that's as good as it gets. 
Uh, this, this. Uh, Can you see anteriorly here, please. Yeah. What are you gonna say? Well, the Robina is is much. I think shows the vascularity much more than the traditional oh, yeah. ICG. Yeah, yeah. It's much more sensitive because most of the time we do not see good vascularity in the distal part. Watch the pulsations there of the blood coming in, the yellow-green variation there. That's it amazing. shows you the actual pulsations of the blood flow. You can see it work its way into the flap. Let me get the gel film now, please. I want to try to get this off of the flap as much as I can. It's just to frame it, helps hold it in place instead of the glue. One more little, well, okay, actually. One more little piece. Make sure this is in contact everywhere, which it is, not folded. Again, I don't want this covering the main flap. It just helps hold the, tack the edges down. You want, what do you want here, Dr. Simon, Maricel? Yeah, we're, we're going to put uh, gel foam and Maricel tampons in the nose. Um, I don't want to use absorbable packing uh, three, um, uh, because I don't think it gives enough pressure. I want firm counter pressure so this patient doesn't get a CSF leak. We will also lower the intracranial pressure by placing a lumbar drain, of course. Oh, yeah. Dr. Snyderman, can you comment a little bit on um, how you uh, follow up the patients and adjunct treatment for uh, a resection like this if uh, the margins came back negative or if they're close margins um, and depending on what right. the PET shows? So, you know, we'll see this patient back in a week to take the packing out. Um, hopefully, we'll have the pathology report by then. You know, if there's an accessible positive margin, you could not you could make an argument for going back and taking additional. Um, but but based on the extent of this tumor, we are going to recommend postoperative radiation therapy. Any KD stage, any KDC tumor really should have combined therapy. Now, we aren't going to put the Maricels in at this point because we still don't have our, our frozen pathology back yet. As soon as we get that, we'll, we can place them. And then, and then we generally want to we wait, you know, cycle. one to two months. Over here, what about C? You know, we, we want to wait one to two months for complete healing before we would consider starting radiation therapy. So doing this uh, with an endonasal approach doesn't necessarily get you into radiation therapy sooner. We still have to wait for healing. Okay. And then, and then uh, after radiation is complete, we'll start uh, getting a follow-up scan uh, roughly uh, two to three months after the completion of radiation. And then we'll probably go with, you know, the scans every six months for a few years to make sure it doesn't come back. Okay, and then year, yearly uh, for many years. These patients are at risk for more than 10 years. So, uh, more stuff. Let me get a 45 ethmoid. Anterior is the highest risk area. So we'll make sure there's a good pressure on the anterior edge of our graft, keeping it against the posterior table of the frontal sinus. Happier with that now? Yep. Nice rainbow colors. Yes. So, as I said, uh, we'll place some Maricel tampons um, and some little splints inside the nose, and that's pretty much the end of the surgery. Uh, thank you for attending today. It's there, been a real pleasure. Absolutely. Appreciate everyone's attention and the excellent questions. You can really see the knowledge base of the audience. Any other questions at all, uh, George or uh, Dr. Zenos or Dr. Wong? That you uh, see in the uh, We've managed a lot in the chat, um, and uh, I think, you know, I think we're, it's a wrap up. It was a great uh, session, great discussions, excellent points, great procedures. <laughs> um, I think it was a good day. I want to thank all our staff. Uh, uh, thank Mary Jo for making this happen, as always. And uh, thank you all for your attention. All right, everyone have a great day.